And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It. Today, we're going to be talking about the O.J. Simpson case. You guys have been requesting this one. We got a lot to break down. Let's get into it, baby. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Fed It covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. I'm reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, was 6 9 And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, 6 9 ran with. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes. AKA Pusha T violated. In order to stay away from the victim. Trapper Pusha T arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds, Miami Strip Club, injured one person. The, this is the one that, that's going to fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, it happened at the gun range. Here's your boy 42 Doug right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. They can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm going to love my 50 minutes. And well, the first bomb the went off right here. Suspect to set down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, the brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lin Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay? Trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It, man. Uh, today, we're going to be breaking down the O.J. Simpson case. This case has been highly requested. I spent the past week researching this thing. Go back into memory lane real quick. So I'm 32 years old, guys. I was born in 1990. I vividly remember the Bronco chase through the streets of LA when I was, what, four years old at the time. And man, it was crazy. And I remember my dad was like glued to the TV, watching this case from beginning to end. So I know he's going to love this breakdown in particular, man. So uh, shout out to Pops out there. You know who you are, you old fuck. But anyway, <laughs> guys, this is probably the biggest case, like the most sensationalized case in US history. I don't think there was another case that got this kind of coverage. This thing makes the Amber Heard situation look like a joke. This was a 10th month long trial. It was a ridiculous story. You got a famed former NFL star turned actor, turned sponsored athlete with Hertz, you know, accused of murdering his wife, okay, who was a Caucasian attractive woman, by the way, and uh, and another Caucasian male in cold blood, man, the violence. It, and we're going to talk about this in a documentary. We're going to react to a documentary. I got a couple documentaries here, actually, that we're going to react to. But it was crazy. I remember you you couldn't explain um, what it was like. I can't even explain it. Like, you, if you lived through it, you know what I'm talking about. And I was a kid. I can only imagine for the guys out there that were adults. This was crazy. So anyway, let's get right into it, guys. I'm going to go ahead and share screen with y'all real fast. And we're going to go ahead and get right into it. So who's O.J. Simpson, guys? O.J. Simpson is Orenthal James Simpson, born July 9, 1947, nicknamed The Juice, is an American football, uh, former football running back, broadcaster, and convicted felon who played for the Buffalo Bills and San Francisco 49ers of the NFL. Once a popular figure with the U.S. public, he is now best known for being tried for the murders of his former wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. Simpson was acquitted of the murders of criminal court, but was later found responsible for both deaths in a tr civil trial. Okay, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. He went to USC, guys, where he was a star. Um, he played for the Trojans, won the Heisman Trophy in 1968, played professionally as running back in the NFL for 11 seasons, primarily with the Buffalo Bills from 1969 to 1977. He also played for the San Francisco 49ers from 78 to 79. In 1973, he became the first NFL player to rush for more than 2,000 yards in a season. He holds the record for the single season yards per game average, which stands at 143.1. He was the only player to rush for over 2,000 yards in the 14-game regular season NFL format. Simpson was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1983 and the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1985. After retiring from football, he began a new career in acting and football broadcasting. 
And, uh, you know, and then this goes into the case, which we'll we'll go ahead and that's obviously going to be summarized later on. Now we got his wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, guys. OK, which um, he met her when she was 18, guys, at a restaurant. She was, uh, I think, a, either a server or a greeter, a hostess. Uh, she was the ex-wife of former and a professional American football player, O.J. Simpson, whom she was married to from 1985 to 1992. She was born in 59, guys, so she died at 35. Um, she was the mother of their two children, Sydney and Justin. Two years after her divorce from Simpson, Brown was stabbed to death at her Los Angeles home on June 12, 1994, along with her friend, waiter Ron Goldman. Okay, Simpson, who had a history of physical abuse, of physically abusing and making death threats towards Brown, was arrested and accused of both killings. Following a controversial, highly publicized criminal trial, which included evidence linking Simpson to the murders, Simpson was acquitted of all charges. He was later found liable for both deaths in a civil lawsuit in 1997. Okay, what, what do you guys mean by, like, uh, liable? Okay, so in civil court, guys, the burden of proof is far less. In a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil case, it's uh, preponderance of the evidence, which just pretty much means 51%, okay? If you can prove 51% that you are liable, bam, you're going to be found liable, and that's how civil cases are typically done. So... Um, obviously, they weren't able to convict them in the criminal court, but they had more than enough information in the civil court. And we're going to talk about a key piece of evidence that they used in the civil trial that they did not, they did not use in the criminal trial um, in the civil case. Okay, so we're going to talk about that as well. Man, I did my homework, so we're ready to go. I'm all hopped up, man. I got this uh, this Monster Energy drink. It's freaking what? 5.30 in the morning right now. We did the Trump show earlier. My boy, Andrew, guys. So um, obviously this is a pre-recorded broadcast. You guys are going to catch this one probably later on in the week, but make sure to check out that Trump broadcast as well. So now let's go into um, Ron Goldman here. So uh, Ron Goldman, uh, okay. Ronald Life Goldman, born July 2nd, 1968 to 1994, was an American restaurant waiter and a friend of Nicole Brown Simpson, the ex-wife of the American football player, OJ Simpson. He was murdered along with Brown at her home in Los Angeles, California, on June 12, 1994, Simpson was acquitted of the killings in 1995, but found liable for both deaths in a 1997 civil lawsuit. I want to make a quick note here with this guy. <laughs> Guys, six foot one, trained in martial arts, okay? We're going to talk about that's going to be important here very soon, okay? And I have a bombshell of a theory of what I think actually happened on June 12, 1994. Um, it takes different facets um, from different facts, from different perspectives, but I think I have a pretty damn good idea on what happened on that fateful night, and I will go ahead and reveal that for you guys at the end of the broadcast, so stay tuned, and I will give it to you guys. You guys know I'm a former Fed, so I was able to basically look at all the different do documentaries. I looked at the evidence. I looked at the gruesome murder photos, which I actually have here in this tab, which I'm reluctant to show y'all because it is really bad, guys. I mean, I don't even know if it's safe for YouTube, but uh, maybe I'll show you guys later on. But it, yeah, th these these photographs were bad. But anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get into guys the um, the documentary, okay? Um, and I'm gonna be pausing this thing as we can as we uh, go through it. Um, this is an older documentary, guys. It's called uh, O.J. Simpson Untold uh, Story. I went ahead and got the best resolution version of it possible on YouTube, um, which was at 480p. So I had to get it in parts broken down. But let's go ahead. I'll pause it intermittently as needed. But this one, I think, gives a pretty good overall view of uh, a bird's eye view of the investigation from a holistic standpoint. It's fairly unbiased. Um, and we're going to go ahead and just work our way through this thing, man. So let's uh, get into it. Sit back, enjoy, and let's go. Former American football star and actor O.J. Simpson stood accused of murdering his ex-wife Nicole and waiter Ron Goldman in a bloody... These older documentaries are always better, by the way, than these new ones. Election. ...find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of penal code section The verdict divided America and the world. In the eyes of many, despite his repeated protestations of innocence, he was and remains a guilty man. Divided is an understatement, guys. When this verdict broke, literally, all the black people were going crazy. All the white people were pissed as fuck. <laughs> and it was just wild, guys, because you got to keep in mind, let's go ahead and look at the atmosphere of the United States in the mid-90s, okay? So you had the Rodney King beating that happened a few years prior. You had the L.A. race riots. You had, obviously, um, guys, remember, Martin Luther King had only been killed less than 30 years prior to this, okay? The 90s was still very sensitive uh, to race back then, especially Los Angeles, which had a history of um, police misconduct, racism, etc. So for this to happen in Los Angeles, 
okay, of all places with a, you know, prominent African-American former athlete that was loved. Guys, O.J. Simpson was loved. He was charismatic. He was charming. He was attractive to the ladies. He was a uh, he was a ladies man. He had done his thing. He had children. He was like the, you know, he had made it from the gutter. He originally grew up in San Francisco and, you know, was a college uh, athlete, was a star, had a, you know, a, a very vibrant smile, pause, and people loved him. So he had a, a Caucasian woman, right? As you guys saw from the photos before, Nicole Simpson was extremely attractive. He met her when she was 18. He was going, he was getting ready to divorce his wife at the time. Um, he met her, I think in 1977 when she was a hostess, they, they dated each other for seven, six to seven years. And then they ended up getting married in 85. So, um, this murder guys was, it was a, it was a microcosm of what was really going on in the United States at the time when it comes to race. Things were still split in the 90s, guys. The civil rights era was still fresh in people's minds. Um, there was still a bunch of uh, racist stuff going on. There was still police brutality going on to a greater extent than it is nowadays, um, arguably, arguably so. Um, and yeah, it, it was it was a different era, guys. It was a different era. You know, obviously, gangster rap was just starting to make uh, uh, make its move. Uh, you know, the chronic had been released in 1992. I think Doggy Style came out uh, not long after that. Tupac was still alive at this time. This was a very, um, you know, and he was saying fuck the police and all this other shit. No, uh, B.I.G. was alive at this time. So this was a very pivotal era in race relations between blacks and whites in the United States. And for it to happen in Los Angeles with a black and white couple for Nicole Simpson to be murdered the way that she was with the violence and the, the grotesque atmosphere that they were found in. Guys, you know, it's literally the makings of uh, literally like a thriller. You know, this is like some shit out of leg legitimately, literally out of Hollywood. So when these verdicts came down, it was wild. And speaking of which, by the way, this is Rob Kardashian right here. This is Kim Kardashian's father, a close friend of OJ Simpson and also an attorney. He was a part of this dream team, which we're going to talk about here in a second. But the world has not been told the full story. That's his son, OJ's son right here. Tonight, this film reveals that the evidence heard in court was only part of the real picture. It also Johnny Cochran, legend, Shapiro, right? All-star team of attorneys. Reveals that clues which pointed away from Simpson as the killer were dismissed or ignored. It shows that crucial evidence was tampered with and destroyed. That the police so contaminated the crime scene that the evidence was unsafe. And it reveals that there is a potential suspect. A close member of Simpson's family who has never been questioned. And that six months before her murder, someone was offered money to kill Nicole. This is OJ, the untold story. All right. On the night of the 12th of June, 1994, O.J. Simpson was a man without an alibi. Was he chipping golf balls in his backyard, as he claimed? Or was he driving to Nicole's house in a white Ford Bronco to commit a grisly double murder? That porn star music. All right, so I'm noticing the sound is kind of like going in and out. What I'm going to do is if it keeps doing this, I'm going to go ahead and just play the full documentary from another tab. I don't want to do that because it's not as good quality as this one, but let's let's see how it goes. Bundy Drive in the comfortable suburbs of West Los Angeles, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman lay murdered with multiple stab wounds. They were discovered shortly after midnight. When I looked at the bodies, this to me was a rage killing. There were numerous crazy guys. Slash That's Ron Goldman, and the uh, the still from before was um was Nicole Simpson. 
stab wounds. They appeared to be all over the bodies. Uh, one of now, this is Tom Lynch. He was the lead detective on this investigation, guys. So that what that means is that he was the primary case detective case, or case officer in this case. You know, we talk all the time about case agent, case detective, case officer, whatever it may be. He was the primary person that put this case together that oversaw this investigation. OK, contrary to popular belief, a lot of people say, oh, no, it was Furman. No, it was not Furman. It was Tom Lynch, guys. And we're going to talk, talk about Furman here as well. Victims had what we call the bled out, if you will. Uh, the wounds were so severe, uh, and that was Nicole Brown. She was lying on a, on a walkway that angled down towards the street, and the blood was flowing in that direction. This is a crime of passion, overkill, jealousy, domestic, something of that nature. Rage, yes, absolutely. I mean, this alone shows you bang, 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 bang. Those murders were ghastly. They were awful murders. I mean, Nicole Simpson had a slash of her throat that went all the way down into the vertebral column, three millimeters into the vertebral column. Guys, in English, that means she was nearly decapitated. Okay? Literally, the ver like the, the spinal like cord basically is where they cut into the person that did this, which requires enormous force and strength, okay? And we're going to talk about this um, a little bit later on when it comes to the predictions. But um, no one, absolutely no one deserves to die in that way. You know, I, I mean, uh, yeah, you know, uh, rest in peace to her. And, and obviously, you know, she was, she was a mother of two at the time when she passed away. And uh, to, to be killed in that fashion is unacceptable, you know? Um, but we're going to talk about uh, the theories and who I think actually did this. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, I don't think it was OJ alone, but we're going to get into this in a little bit down the road. Okay, there's a lot more to it. But let's keep going. The detectives that arrived at Nicole's house on Bundy Drive in the early hours of the morning faced a forensic jigsaw puzzle. There was a left-handed leather glove covered in blood, bloody footprints, and five drops of blood heading away from the scene to the rear of the property. Here is pretty obvious what happened. There was a struggle. The left glove came off during the struggle. The left hand or the left side of this perpetrator's body was injured. And as that person moved away, they bled. There was also an envelope containing a pair of glasses, which they later found Ron Goldman had come to deliver to Nicole. Thirty-five-year-old Nicole had been divorced from O.J. Simpson for two years. With two children together, Sydney and Justin, they had been fated as the perfect mixed-race couple. But their relationship had broken down, despite numerous reconciliations. And since her divorce, Nicole had begun to live life in the... F and obviously this right here, okay... We talk about this all the time on, obviously, the Fresh Fit podcast, if you guys don't know, um, the, the visceral rage that this causes in men when uh, their woman or, you know, their, whether the girl that they're with or a former lover is with other males. As you can see, this guy right here is grabbing her by the breasts, kissing her neck. Um, and keep in mind, guys, that OJ married Nicole when she was 18, okay? And they basically broke it off when she was in her, you know, early 30s. So he was with her for a significant amount of time from 77 all the way into the early 90s. So she had never really been single, okay? Now, as you guys know, and the, at, 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 the, at this point in the 90s, right, feminism was still making its wave. You know, people were, you know, encouraging women to get out there and date, be single, entertain your options. Um, and this obviously um, influenced her to a degree. Okay. Fast lane. I think within the last year plus of her life, I think she blew a fuse. I mean, something happened. And I guess, you know, the drugs would do that. You know, here she is one moment, a faithful wife, um, dedicated, you know, loving. And the next, like I said, the rumors you hear, she's doing coke or she's sleeping around and, and I, it was, it was the whole thing, man. It was, it was really, it was, it was very sad. 
And this was the rumors that were going on. And and the thing is, is that OJ actually, guys, because I had done a bunch of research for this, watching other documentaries, reading things, whatever it may be. OJ had seen her having sex with someone else when he had went to her home. OK, they were still hooking up after the divorce. He went to her home one time on Bundy Drive, was going to go ahead and try to, you know, get some and saw her hooking up with a guy in a silhouette. And obviously that's going to enrage him, right? Like, I mean, even if you're divorced or whatever, that's going to piss you off. This is a woman that you have children with that you've been with for a very long time. Um, so again, you guys think I'm kidding around. I've always said it. OJ simp sin. Okay. This is why guys, it's so important, man, to be RP aware and understand female nature. And when things are over, they're fucking over. You got to move on. You got to, got to move on because emotion and passion will make you do stupid things as a man. Okay, let's continue on. On the evening of the murder, Nicole had gone to see her daughter Sydney dancing in a school show. Simpson was also there. This is actual footage from him showing up to the recital, by the way, guys. This is on June 12th, the day of the murder. He'd heard that day that his affair with girlfriend Paula Barbieri was over. After the show, Simpson went home while Nicole went on to a family dinner at the fashionable Mezzaluna restaurant where... Okay, this restaurant, guys, was really a poppin' place back in the 90s. All the celebs used to go there, used to go eat. Um, it's the equivalent to nowadays, if you guys are familiar with Los Angeles, this Los Angeles scene, there's a place... Um, God damn it. Now, I, I, the name escapes me. Shout out to AD from No Jumper. He took us there a couple of times. Uh, and the guy, the the guys, the cool dudes over there from Big Chief, uh, I'm going to go ahead and remember the name of it. But it's the equivalent to that restaurant. You know, on Wednesday nights, it's pretty lit and everyone goes there. All the rappers go there. All the celebs go there. Um, so Mezzaluna was kind of on that level back in the 90s, guys. OK, very popular um, restaurant. Ron Goldman worked as a waiter. Nicole was a frequent visitor. Since her divorce, she had become involved with various men from the restaurant. And six foot one, 25 year old Goldman was rumored to be a boyfriend. He had been As y'all can see, he's a Chad, right? <laughs> and, you know, there was uh, definitely like rumors that they were hooking up with each other on the day that she went, actually, guys. And I know this from inside information. Uh, he did not. He, he was there working the day that she went with her family to go eat. However, that that night. However, he did not serve her, okay? He had another waitress go ahead and take care of that table, which also is a clue, right, that I think that they were hooking up, all right? And we're going to get into a little bit more as to how I think uh, what made me come to this conclusion. But, yes, he did not serve her on this day when she went to the restaurant. However, he was there, which, unfortunately, is what's going to lead to his demise, and we'll get into that here in a second been to her house and been seen driving her Ferrari. 25 years old, six foot one, good shape, martial artist, and an expiring actor, by the way, as well, guys. Nicole and the children had returned home by 9.15. When detectives arrived, candles were alight. There was music playing, and a bath was still warm. Rod Englert faced the task of trying to reconstruct what happened. Nobody will ever know what was in her mind when she walked out because she left her front door open, walked a few feet down the landing, down the steps where the attack occurred, and she was stabbed four times in the left side of the neck. Gruesome, by the way. And, and yeah, she was wearing a black dress. She was barefoot, and she had run a bath, candle. She was going to try to relax, um, and she had just put the kids to bed, and she was waiting on Ron to come and deliver some glasses, guys, okay? So when she was there at the restaurant earlier, her mother had left her prescription glasses there, and she called Ron to ask him to bring the glasses, and he put them in an envelope, and he came by to drop them off because he lived nearby. He had basically went home, changed clothes, which is why he had the, the apparel that you guys saw him with before, to deliver the glasses. The evidence suggests that Ron Goldman walked up, and he is then attacked and a struggle between the two, a confrontation between the two occurs in her blood that's already bleeding. So she had to be down for her blood to bleed to the extent that it had already bled. But if Nicole went down quickly, the forensic evidence showed that Ron Goldman was involved in a violent struggle. He's struggling, he's fighting, he's twisting, he's turning, he's doing everything that he can to survive 
And and the reason for that, guys, is because he's a trained martial artist. The guy is obviously in great shape. He's 25 years old. Um, and, and just so y'all know, um, Simpson at the time uh, when this occurred was about 20 years older than this guy. OK, uh, Simpson, guys, was born in 47. OK, if you go 1994, right, versus um, 1947, OJ was damn near 50 years old at the time of this this murder. OK, so he's going ahead and fighting with someone that's 20 years his junior. OK, in better shape, six for one, about the same height as Juice. OK, a.k.a. OJ Simpson. Uh well, he's a formidable opponent, which is which, which explains the blood all over the place. And the attacker definitely got bruised up to a degree. I mean, Ron Goldman had stab wounds in his leg because he was kicking this guy. He was um, he had an enormous amount of defensive wounds, guys. OK, and the defensive wound, guys, is basically a wound that is uh, a wound that indicates that you were in an altercation defending yourself from an attacker, right? So a lot of the times you'll get defensive wounds on your hands, right? Scrapes and cuts, et cetera, because you're trying to keep yourself from uh, getting cut up in any anywhere vital. It's a natural instinct. So not only did he have, he have a lot of defensive wounds, he had a lot of wounds that uh, basically was indicative of someone legitimately fighting this guy back, okay? So the attacker definitely got fucked up to a degree. The other person is doing everything that he can to quieten him and kill him. And the best way... You can see him over there. Uh, he put up a fight, man. And, and no one, uh, again, no one deserves to die in, in this manner. He went out fighting. That's that's for sure. To silence someone, one has to know that you sever the throat. And that's a kill. And I have very gruesome photos from that as well, man. Uh, I'm, I'm debating whether I'm going to show them here, uh, but we'll keep going. Tom Lang and three other detectives then went up to Simpson's house, a five minute drive away on Rockingham Avenue. OK, before we get into this, guys, um, real quick, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys what the prosecution thinks happened. OK, the actual um, the fights. OK, so there's this video right here. I'm going to go ahead and show you all this thing. And this is um, this was basically an. Uh, a cartoon rendition of what they believe actually happened. I disagree with this um, to a degree, and, I, and, I, and I'll give you guys my analysis at the end of it. But this is from people that were on the scene, um, what they believe happened. And this was basically what the prosecution was trying to argue uh, that occurred on that fateful night. Engineers and forensics experts who were given unprecedented access to the Simpson Goldman murder scene have assembled this scenario. And sorry for the quality, guys. This is the 90s. You know, what, what, what can you do here, right? So. You're seeing an overhead aerial shot of the Bundy Drive geometry of this section of town where you can see there's a number of condos side by side. This area is where the murder occurs. In reality, it's covered up with trees. There are steps and a gate and a dirt area beside the front entryway and a patio. But we took the tree out so you could see that. Now we're going to put the tree in because the night of the murder, the tree provides incredible shade and it's extremely dark in this area. At this point, Mr. Goldman comes up to the gate, punches it and rings the doorbell. Nicole Simpson leaves her condo and she actually leaves the front door ajar to come down and open the gate. And just so y'all know, this neighborhood is extremely uh, wealthy, very nice neighborhood in, in L.A. It's a suburb of uh, it's a section of L.A. Uh, that's very nice. Um, so, you know, you can keep the door open in areas like this. There's obviously a speakerphone and she knows who her visitor is. Literally, the assailant has to come from the patio area or the physical arrangements of the subjects make no sense. The way he attacks them immobilizes them both. He hits the right side of Mr. Goldman's face with his left hand and does so very hard. There's a substantial bruise on the right side of his face. Simultaneously or very soon thereafter, we believe the assailant hits Nicole Simpson on the left side of her face with the butt of his knife, the pommel. And that knocks her right side of her head into the wall. We believe that knocks her up, which enables the assailant now to come down and deal with the number one threat which is the young, able, and in pretty good shape, Mr. Goldman. 
We postulate that he puts the point of the knife behind Mr. Goldman's head and actually uses the knife like a fork with his hand over the mouth to raise Mr. Goldman to his feet. The medical examiner has testified that that wound alone would have been sufficient to kill Mr. Goldman if nothing else had been done to him. It's obvious from the medical evidence that the assailant has a hand over Mr. Goldman's mouth, is having a talk with Mr. Goldman, and is emphasizing his points with the knife. The neck. Now, here's the thing. Goldman is a trained fighter, and this is where I kind of, and again, this is what the prosecution was trying to allege here. Goldman was a trained fighter. We know from the, the wounds and the way he was cut up and everything else like that, he had a lot of defensive wounds, guys. He fought this motherfucker, okay? He was, th this attacker took a beating, guys. We, we know that, okay? So this right here, again, I'm showing you all this because this is what the prosecution was trying to articulate in their in their argument, which, which honestly was, was a big part of why they took a L in this case in, in general. But um, let's continue on. Next fatal blow received by Mr. Goldman is a plunge right over his heart hitting him in the left side of his torso. Another thrust, again from the back, upwards under the rib cage, which is also a fatal thrust. And he takes a final knife blow in this side, another fatal wound. And we postulate he falls away into the fence. We see abrasion marks down the back of his scalp, which we believe is a result of falling down the fence. And then he falls over, and that is literally the position he is found by the police the next morning. With Mr. Goldman dealt with, the assailant is now free to turn his attention to Nicole. The assailant uses the same technique to lift her as he does Mr. Goldman. Hand over mouth, most important. It's clear again that the assailant is talking to Nicole Simpson. The reason we know this is before the final fatal cut of her throat, there are three other small cuts on her throat parallel to where the fatal blow is going to be administered. It's clearly again torture. The final cut across her throat is going to be delivered with her head cocked substantially back. And the strength in that cut is enormous. And by that I mean she is going to receive a single slice to the front of the throat that is going to be so deep it is going to nick her spinal cord. That requires tremendous strength for a... This is true. Definitely it takes a ridiculous amount of strength, regardless of how sharp the knife is, to be able to hit that part of the body. Single cut. I don't care how sharp your knife is. The assailant notices he has lost his wool cap. And in the animation, he touches his head. Unlike our animation, which has got enough light level for you to see what's going on, in the real scene, this was very, very dark, and it's a dark wool cap. He's trying to feel for the which is why he was able to hide there in the first place because obviously it is dark as hell and they didn't even see the assailant come up he obviously had the element of surprise attacking them um otherwise you know um <clears throat> rod rod Go goldman would have been able to you know much better defend himself the wool cap he can't feel anything through the gloves he has to take the gloves off to feel for the wool cap by taking off both gloves and not being careful about it, he actually le ends up leaving a glove behind and not retrieving the wool cap. We speculate that something disturbed him in his search and cut it short, whether it be a dog barking or some neighbor's voice or something. When the investigators arrive, they're going to... And that's actually how they were able to find uh, Nicole Simpson's body was through her dog barking and blood prints on the paws. They find Nicole's body in this position, Mr. Goldman's in this one. They're going to find the net skull cap here. They're going to find a glove very close by it, Mr. Goldman's pager, and his keys are all going to be found in these rows. And guys, pay attention to that hat and glove. We're going to revisit that here later on, which will be a critical component as to my theory on what I think really happened on that night. Okay, I think this rendition here is inaccurate, <laughs> extremely inaccurate. Uh, however, this is what the prosecution alleged um happen on that night obviously they have to um frame it in a way to make it where oj simpson was the murderer okay relative positions we believe this to be the most detailed reconstruction done to date 
we hope it remains the standard by which all other reconstructions are judged by, even the prosecutions. Of course, an animation from the O.J. Simpson defense team would show a different conclusion. But for this animation, failure investigators used evidence presented in court, autopsy reports and detailed data they gathered from the scene of the murders. The medical evidence is literally the most important to establishing this scenario of the crime. The choreography, the movement of the characters to the scene has been driven by the medical evidence because the choreography has to produce the wounds and they have to be produced in a certain order. The hat is found. Well, where's the cut on the leg then? We know Ron Goldman kicked this guy for sure. We know he kicked him. You know, where's the wound on the leg? Because he had a se severe cut to his leg, guys. OK, um, that's why if you look at his left pant leg in the photograph, OK, it was very bloody. OK, and let me see if I can get a picture of that for you for y'all real fast. So you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not capping with I believe the number is 26 African-American hairs in it. There doesn't seem to be any contrary testimony or even dispute over the hat as belonging to the assailant. So we merely followed the physical evidence of the scene. Wrong. That is, the hair did not match O.J. Simpson, okay? That's a little for y'all. The hat, the, the hair on the hat did not match O.J. Simpson, guys, okay? Which, again, we'll come back to my theory later on. All right, so let's go back to the original um, documentary. So quick little recap for y'all that are just joining. The murder occurred. Ron Goldman, Nicole Simpson have been killed. Now they're um, uh, basically the police have been called. They show up on the scene. They see the massacre. And the first thing they say is, all right, we got to go talk to OJ, who lives down the street on Rockingham. OK, she's on Bundy. He's on Rockingham. And just so you guys know, and I'll go ahead and pull this up on a map for y'all to show you guys how close they actually were to each other. <clears throat> but now the police are rolling up to go ahead and let OJ know, hey, listen, your wife was just murdered and they are are worried that he might be the next victim. OK. He had to be informed, but as the ex-husband, he was also a potential suspect. On their arrival, Detective Mark Furman told his colleagues that he'd found a speck of blood on the door of Simpson's white Ford Bronco, which was parked outside. The detective then went on to the property and found that Simpson had left for Chicago a few hours before at 11 p.m. During their search of the house, Detective Furman said he found a right-handed glove covered in blood. So... Detective Mark Furman is the one that discovered this glove at Rockingham outside of O.J. Simpson's house. And I also want to let you guys know as well that an interesting point was what happened was they showed up to the house and they couldn't get an answer out of anybody. So Furman went ahead and scaled the fence and went to the front door to go ahead and try to get a hold of somebody. No one answered. So he went to the back guest house and was able to speak to one of O.J.'s friends who was staying with him. And the guest said, hey, I heard some noise in the back area. I don't know what it was, though. That's why Mark Furman walked back into this area and saw the glove. OK, and that's this is going to uh, open up a can of worms later on. But um, that's how he came to find this glove, by the way, guys, just because I don't know if this documentary documented that. Furman had been to Bundy. Uh, it's, it's not too difficult to put two and two together. It's still four. He sees what appears to be a matching glove. And it's a right-handed glove. This now becomes a crime scene. As dawn broke, the police said they found spots of Simpson's blood on the drive of his house and in the entrance hall. Simpson was now the prime suspect. Now, another thing, too, that I want to tell you guys is that um, them being able to uh, scale the house and go there the reason why they were able to do that is because the detectives were able to articulate, hey, we got someone that's an eminent danger. His wife was brutally murdered down the street. We don't know if he's necessarily a suspect. We need to alert him for his own personal safety. So that's why Furman went ahead and jumped the fence. Because keep in mind, they don't know who committed the crime. Okay? They're just like, oh, shit. 
we need to let OJ know because he's down the road. He's associated with this woman. So that's why they scaled the fence and they were able to go ahead, get inside and talk to the resident and then uh, to establish where OJ was. And then that's when the resident, right, the, the, the friend at the guest house told Furman, I heard some noise over here. So that gives him the ability to go, okay, let me investigate, make sure that someone isn't on this property, whatever. Bam. And he finds the glove. So the, 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 there's fourth amendment, um, fourth amendment, uh, things that you can go ahead and circle there. There's, how do I say this? There's exceptions to the fourth amendment. Sorry. Sorry guys. Late night here. Okay. It's six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Ain't no sleep. All right. There's exceptions to the fourth amendment. And one of them guys is, you know, eminent danger of, you know, bodily serious bodily harm etc so if i have information that someone is going to go ahead and, and and um they're in danger or whatever i can break into the home to go ahead and rescue that person okay that is an exception to the fourth amendment rule so that's how he was able to get onto the property and not have an issue and then he goes to investigate makes contact with someone there that person tells him hey i heard a noise in this vicinity I don't know what happened. So at this point, Mark Furman has a right to be, okay? And we always say in law enforcement, when you have a right to be, you have a right to see. So he was lawfully on the property because he was able to get in under a Fourth Amendment exception, a.k.a., you know, serious danger. Then makes contact with someone. That person gives him more, how do I say this, more evidence, more probable cause, right? Or reasonable suspicion, whatever you want to say here in this case. More probable cause, we'll just say that, to go ahead and further investigate to make sure that there isn't someone trespassing on the property trying to uh, find and or hurt O.J. Simpson. And that's how he came across the glove. For any of you guys out there, they're like, well, how did the cops, uh, how were they able to, you know, hop the fence, open the gate, get in there? Isn't that, an, uh, isn't that a, a violation of the Fourth Amendment? And under normal pretenses, you would be correct. However, remember, guys, we're not judged on uh, police officers are not judged on 2020 hindsight. They're judged on what were the facts known to them at the time. OK, they show up to a murder scene, wife and friend brutally murdered. Holy shit. We don't know who the hell this is. We might have a crazy serial killer on the house. Who is going to be the next likely victim? Maybe O.J. Simpson. We don't know what's going on here. Let's race to his house. He's right down the street. Race to his house. They don't see anything. Bro, we got to get in there and make sure this guy's OK. Scale the fence. Knock on a door. Don't see him there. Go back to the guest house. Hey, OJ, you there? Blah, blah, blah. Make contact with the uh, with the guest. He tells him, I heard a funny sound in the back. Firm it. That gives Furman more ammunition to stay on the property. Right to be means right to see. Finds the glove. Bam. Admissible evidence now. Okay. See how that all works in tandem, guys? Let's keep going. Like the goddamn video, by the way. You guys are not going to get breakdowns like this anywhere else on the internet. Okay. You got a former Fed here breaking down a murder case of the century. And then obviously that goes ahead and leads them, allows them to, you know, establish that the place is a crime scene. And bam, that's when they go ahead and secure the search warrant. OK, to go inside the home and find the droplets of blood, etc. And as the sun is rising, they're able to see the droplets of blood on the uh, on the on the main property on the sidewalk. A few hours later, Detective Bert Looper supervised the search for more clues. In particular, the bedroom we, I wanted to see was the master bedroom, which was OJ's. And I have the photographer take several photographs before we even go in, one of which indicated some socks in the front of the bed on the floor. At first, no one noticed that the socks were bloody, but later analysis showed otherwise. When those socks were examined with high-intensity light, there was a lot of blood because around the ankle, of one of them was 19 projected spatters of blood all the way around. And there were 39 on the other. That came back to Nicole Brown Simpson's blood, and it was projected. That's the key. Those Holy! <laughs> projected. Socks were present when they're fighting in that particular area. That's probably one of the strongest pieces of evidence in this whole case is that pair of socks. And just so you guys know, real fast, this is the addresses, okay? You got 360 uh, North Rocking Rockingham Ave, right? Los Angeles, California. to A75 uh, Bundy Drive, Los Angeles. And I think it was a... Okay, let me double check the addresses for y'all and I'll bring this back. But as you guys can see in general, look how close this is. We're talking about two miles here, 
Okay. We're a uh, five minute drive, two miles in between the two. Crazy close. Okay. So here's Bundy. All right. And then you got Rockingham over here. Not far at all. Yep. And this is, and then this is, uh, you can see the map here. This is the old, this is, this is the new, um, the new way it looks now. It's been remodeled significantly guys. And actually they changed, <laughs> they changed the address, uh, for Bundy because obviously all the people were going around and trying to take pictures and everything else like that. And I'll go ahead and show you guys a video of what it looks like now and the difference, but obviously very, very close. Okay. And this is the famous tree that they used to distinguish, which I'll show you guys that later. But the main point of that was to show you guys how close um, the addresses were to each other. Simpson flew back from Chicago to face a house full of police and a story that was breaking all over the world. The detectives in charge of the case, Tom Lang and partner Phil Vanatta, immediately spotted what they thought was a vital clue. And keep in mind, guys, that Mark Furman was one of the last detectives to show up, okay, on the crime scene in the, in the, um, in the first place. I think there were 13 detectives there, 13 or 15 detectives, and he was somewhere after 10. We not only wanted a statement from him and attempt to glean inconsistencies down the road, but his hand was bleeding. And guess which hand? His left hand. Okay, what can you say about this? Back up, please. Get out of the way. Well, we have a, a good shot at getting this evidence, and that hand is no evidence, because we know our killer was probably injured on the left side of their body, and guess what else we have? We have a left-handed glove at the crime scene, and he's got his left finger cut. We got and that's some pretty damning evidence right there. Got the finger photographed. He cooperated. We also got his blood. And during the interview, you get these inconsistencies that we eventually got. They interviewed him for about less than 30 minutes, guys. They asked him a bunch of questions about his whereabouts. He gave inconsistent stories about how he got cut. First, he said he smashed the glass and cut his finger. Another time, he said, I'm not sure how I cut my finger, maybe playing with the kids. So he gave a bunch of inconsistent stories as to how he cut his finger. He couldn't really give a, a solid um, story on that. He says he bled all over. But how? Well, first, it's on the phone, he believes. And then it was in some other way. Uh, he, he cuts himself all the time. When did you park your Bronco on Rockingham where we found it? I think during a 32 or 33 minute interview, I got three different answers. Okay. Okay, are you a suspect? David, I told you before he wasn't going to say anything. I know you got to ask. While the detectives built their case, Simpson was released to face the media frenzy. Calling you, the police? I was convinced then that he is definitely a viable suspect, but I wasn't 100 percent. Phil was 100 percent. But I also knew handling high profile cases in the past that we better be damn sure. But as we went through the investigation, subsequent to the interview, everything fell in line. There was nothing exculpatory. There was nothing that pointed in another direction. Everything exculpatory, guys, means evidence that shows that it could have been someone else. What they're saying is that there was no other. There wasn't evidence that identified anyone else as the potential perpetrator, which I'll be honest with y'all. Um, nope. There was definitely evidence that pointed that it could have been someone else involved, which we're going to get into later on in this podcast um, when I give you guys my breakdown, what I think actually happened, which I think actually aligns a lot more with the forensic evidence that was found, the wound patterns, et cetera, uh, because I've been doing quite a bit of digging on this case, and I have my theory, but we're going to save that for the end. And here you can see, guys, by the way, here's uh, OJ Simpson broadcasting. I think this is for C MSNBC or something, and there's Nicole in the back. Pointed one direction, and that was that Simpson. For the police, a key discovery was that Simpson had a history of abusive attacks on Nicole, both during their marriage and after they had divorced. There were also suggestions that Simpson had stalked her. The evidence seemed overwhelming. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into part two here. As you guys know, I had to break it up because obviously, um, 
the quality was better when it was chopped up versus like one of the streams that one of the videos that had the best uh that had the, that had it all but it was like 360 was trash at least this one's 480 so you guys can actually see what's going on here it's not as bad of a potato the warrant for simpson's arrest four days after the murders the police issued a warrant for simpson's arrest and just so you guys know uh simpson was arrested in 1989 uh, for on a domestic violence charge against uh, against Nicole, but the police had been called there like eight to nine times prior, so they never actually arrested him. Mind you, guys, this is the '90s. Domestic violence wasn't what it is nowadays. Okay, and on top of that, OJ Simpson was loved in LA. Everyone knew him. The police, a lot of the police officers that responded knew OJ. They would come over and hang out and shoot the shit or whatever it may be. So he was loved in the community. All right, so you know. Is it uh, pro possible that the police just didn't arrest him because he was the juice, he was the cool guy, everyone loved him? Yeah, it's it's possible. You know what I mean? That could be the reason why the police were called so many different times and they didn't actually arrest him until 1989, but they definitely did have their arguments, okay? Um, you know, but it generated from both sides. You know, both, both, both uh, parties definitely antagonized each other. But he didn't surrender as promised. <laughs> And this is the famous Bronco chase. I remember this, man. As a kid, they, they shut everything down. <laughs> like, the NBA Finals were going on. They had television series going on. They didn't give a shit. Everyone was like, you know what? Nope. Play this crap right now. OJ Simpson is on the run from LAPD because he was originally supposed to turn himself in at 11 a.m. He didn't show up. And he has his buddy driving him in the Bronco in this famous chase, man, which was crazy you know and again guys this is the 90s you know this these are different times it's not like uh you know we have television like nowadays where everything is live streaming and everything is lit. like live television back then was kind of like a it's not like it is now it wasn't it didn't have the same ease so this was wild to people the fact that the news were able to cover this from choppers um and oj running away from the police is a wanted murder suspect two counts of murder a terrible crime. We need to find him. We need to apprehend him. We need to bring him to justice as quickly as possible. Instead, with AC Carlings at the wheel, Simpson had visited Nicole's. That's a former teammate and friend, Art AC. Brave. While another family friend and lawyer, Robert Kardashian, read a note that Simpson had left behind. I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. I loved her and always will. I can't go on. No matter what the outcome, people will look and point. And this is how Kim Kardashian got famous, by the way, guys. Her father was famous because he was a very close friend of O.J. Simpson. Um, and, you know, the, him reading this letter is actually like <laughs> uh, was was kind of like uh, something that made him famous, you know, because at the time this was the biggest thing going on. So this brought the Kardashians into the limelight. I can't take that. As the drama unfolded on live television, thousands came out onto the streets to watch the most wanted man in America go by. Crazy, guys. Like, this is wild. People were on the streets with signs. <laughs> I don't even know how they, had, how they had the time. Like, go Juice, we support OJ, blah, blah, blah. Like, everyone was going crazy out on the streets, man. Again, this is a 94, guys. All right, this is a 94. This is before, you know, the internet uh, you know, being made, you know, this was like AOL dial up crap. Like this wasn't on the internet like that. You know, this was on TV. People are running out on the streets to get a glimpse of the, you know, the iconic white Bronco running through the streets of LA. As the Bronco headed back to his house on Rockingham, Simpson held a gun to his head. A SWAT team was called and given their orders. Use no discretion. You take them down if you have to. Ru Pulls into his house. Running after the Bronco was 24-year-old Jason. Okay, there's Jason's son right there, as you guys can see, uh, running after it, pleading with his father to, to um, surrender. Simpson's son by his first marriage. Shortly after the police dragged Jason away from his father, Simpson gave himself up. Okay, and just to let you guys know, Simpson had another marriage prior to this 
with another woman, and he had two children with her. Jason was, I think, the older of that pair. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if a uh, chat. Uh, but Jason was from a prior marriage. He was in no way affiliated or associated to Nicole Simpson, which we're going to talk about that a little bit later. In his own words, a depressed, lost man. In the months that followed, the police continued to build their case. They believed that Simpson had driven over to Bundy and had either stalked Nicole or been driven by Goldman's arrival into a fit of jealous rage. The detectives believed that he had then brutally murdered them both before driving back to his home, spreading blood in his Bronco as he went. The Bronco was a key crime scene in its own right. Rod Englert examined the vehicle when it was taken apart. When the detectives approached the white Bronco that was parked outside of the Rockingham Street address, there was a transfer of blood pattern on the Bronco door that was consistent with the bleeding left hand of O.J. Simpson. It's less than a half inch wide, a little over a quarter inch wide. Consistent with when he reaches up and touches that to open the door. And that pattern is also consistent with the pattern on the inside of the door well where you open the door to get out. The forensic team found Simpson's blood by the driver's door, on the driver's side carpet, on the seats, the instrument panel, and on the steering wheel. But it was the discovery of Nicole Brown's and Ron Goldman's blood, particularly on the center console, that clinched it. For Englert and the team, it appeared to prove that Simpson had been involved in the crime. So that's some pretty damning evidence. And here's the iconic photo, photo right here of O.J. Simpson that has been you know, circulated everywhere. If there's any doubt in anybody's mind about this person not committing this crime, I mean, then they have a real problem with reality. I need something to point in another direction. I need something substantive that says someone else did or could have done this crime. None of that exists. Now, just so just to give you guys a quick little recap of what's going on here. Police show up. See Nicole and Ron Goldman murdered, right? Then they go ahead and they find, obviously, a massacre. So they go to Rockingham where, um, you know, O.J. Simpson lives two miles away. Showed y'all on the map how far that is. Then they go ahead and they scale the fence, find the glove, right? And I broke it down for y'all earlier how they were able to find the glove from a legal sense. Find the glove. Now it's deemed a crime scene. They go ahead and they get a search warrant. Also, as the sun's coming up, they start to see blood droplets going on the sidewalk going into the home, and they find blood in the home, and they find bloody socks in O.J. Simpson's home, okay? The blood, okay, on the socks has Nicole and Ron Goldman's blood uh, DNA on it, okay? And they're also able to find blood between all three parties in the Bronco, okay? So let's go ahead and keep uh, going through this. Absolutely none of that. So the police are like, we got our man. For the police, a mountain of evidence showed that Simpson was the murderer. But is their case really so conclusive? Not only is there significant evidence pointing away from Simpson, but it's also now clear from the new research for this film that there is evidence that the police dismissed or ignored. One private detective has followed it up, and what he has discovered puts the crime in a completely new light. Okay, so before we get into um, this private, uh, this private eye that you know did his own independent investigation, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let y'all go ahead and you know see what you guys think as far as like what he th uh, uh, what his findings and everything else like that. But I will give you guys my theory at the end that combines all aspects of this. Um, and just so you guys know from earlier, I I didn't get a chance to to show you guys this exactly, but I will show you guys this real fast. Because I want to let you guys know that Ron Goldman 100% was fighting this attacker. As you guys can see, look at the cut on his leg, okay? This was from him kicking the individual. And, and you know, viewer discretion is advised, obviously, here. You know, but you can see right here, 
a significant amount of blood is on this leg because he kicked the fuck out that guy. And then the guy stabbed him, the attacker. So um, let's keep going, though. Dallas, Texas. Over the last 40 years, Private Eye Bill Deere has solved a number of major cases and has a reputation for taking nothing for granted. Right from the start, he had major reservations about the police handling of the case, and so began his own investigation. They saw the bloody glove behind the bungalow at OJ's, and they put two and two together. And with a little bit of blood found in the Bronco and a little bit of blood that was found on the driveway, I think they made up their mind very quickly that it was OJ. And from that point on, they went no further. They had their man. And we know that there's like some evidence that shows otherwise, right? For example, the African-American hairs that were on the ball cap uh, or on the hat, not OJ's, okay? They found blood, okay, guys, at the scene that did not match OJ's, okay, guys, in Nicole's fingernails, which we're going to talk about that uh, as a part of her defensive wounds. We're going to talk about that a little bit as well. So there was a considerable amount of evidence and things that also was exculpatory, which the prosecution did not necessarily highlight, okay? And we're going to go ahead and start to look at some of the, um, start attacking the evidence a little bit as the defense was able to do and get OJ off the hook. I felt that in my mind, maybe, just maybe, there's something wrong here. Maybe we're not being told the story. And again, stay tuned till the end of the podcast. I'm going to give you guys my final thoughts on what I think really happened, okay? I'm not saying OJ's innocent, but what I will say is I definitely don't think he acted alone in this situation. We'll talk the case over with colleague Chris Stewart. I can't believe that a guilty man is going to voluntarily go down in the police car, followed by Harold Weissman, his lawyer, and say to the lawyer, lawyer, I don't need you. Just go ahead and sit outside. Go have a cup of coffee. I'll talk to him if I just killed two people. Why would somebody like OJ allow himself to be cross-examined, asked questions, photographed, fingerprinted, everything that they did to him if he was guilty? Well, okay, and this is where the PI is kind of fucking up here. Stupid. Well, he wanted to know what the police knew, okay? That's a big reason why he would cooperate. Also, let's keep in mind, the, a big reason why the police let OJ go was because OJ, besides the cut that he had on his finger, really wasn't fucked up. He didn't get beat up to the extent that they thought someone who fought with Ron Goldman would have gotten beaten up because Ron Goldman had a significant amount of uh, defensive wounds on him where there was a serious altercation, all right? That's another reason, too, why the police let OJ go, okay? He cooperated. He gave him the blood. He gave him, um, he took pictures with his finger. He gave them what they wanted. He gave them an interview. They wanted to keep him somewhat friendly to, to keep him cooperative. Obviously, he was a prime suspect for them, but... They wanted to go ahead and get what they needed to get, so they kept them in a friendly sense. And OJ, right, obviously not innocent in the situation, want to know what the hell was going on with the police, right? What the hell did they know, okay? Because when the police originally called him, his first question was, who did it, okay? Which is very, very important, so make a note of that, guys. We're going to talk about this later on. The case is too comfortable. That's the problem I've got with it. It's too packed. And I told Chris, I said, you know, I've got to know the truth. Bill Deere then went out to Los Angeles to examine the crime scene for himself. This is uh, where her black Jeep was found. The back gate's been changed. The number's been changed. But other yeah, they changed it to 879 Bundy, guys, because so many people were going there trying to look for it like 875 Bundy. So they were able to go ahead and get the address changed. But people still know where it's located. And this is the exit from which... Uh, O.J. left, allegedly, okay? From that, this is the way it was when I arrived about three weeks after the murders. And uh, that night, I came back, posted Chris across the street in the car to watch out, watch from my back, and uh, hiked myself up over the fence. I came down the steps, walked a narrow passageway, up steps, down steps, and there I'm standing there by her door. And uh, I'm looking now, and I still see some blood there. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm looking at what I've been told by the press, that he was hiding behind the bushes. And I'm saying, he can't be hiding behind the bushes. There's a brick wall there separating one neighbor to the other. 
there had to be a lot of commotion and a lot of screaming because these people were fighting for their life. Ron Goldman was a young man fighting for his life. The coal was young, didn't want to die. Upstairs, you had two minor children. I think that's one of the things that really bothered me all along. I'm a father. I'm a single parent. I could no more picture myself coming to your killing some, either my ex-wife or whatever. And leave- well, you also got to remember, my friend, that OJ was mad as fuck because he knew that she was out here smashing dudes, doing cocaine. Uh, they also had arguments, guys, because OJ did not like the people that she was hanging out with. Nicole, guys, was hanging out at the that Italian restaurant I told you all about, the, the Mezzolula, or I'm, I'm probably butchering that, sorry. Uh, which had some nefarious people that were working there, so to speak, without me going into too much detail. So OJ had issues with the types of people that she was surrounding herself with. And he was mad because um, he didn't want the kids to be around these types of people. OK, so they had a lot of arguments on that as well. Leaving my two minor children to walk out and see the mother, the cold, lying there with her head nearly decapitated and Ron Goldman laying against the fence, bleeding all over the place with his eyes wide open. Nobody as a parent could do that. Another thing that was funny, and the people that we talked to, they all said to me, did you know that OJ, it bothers him, the sight of blood? A weapon such as a knife is a weapon of choice. OJ could have done anything other than used a knife if he was afraid of blood. If you're going to use a knife, you're going to be cutting somebody, you're certainly going to see blood. Yeah, but that could be, you know, overridden by your rage and hate for someone, you know. So, again, this P.I., he misses, but he definitely hits on some things as well. He brings some really, really interesting investigative points uh, during the course of his independent investigation, which we're going to get into here very shortly. They arrested O.J. right after he came back from the trip. To me, when they examined him, there should have been some bruises on him that were indicative of a fight. Agreed. To Bill Deere, it was impossible for the killer to have come out of such a fight with nothing but a cut on his hand. And what's more, Ron Goldman was no average opponent. He was trained in karate. I think that's the one thing that really caught me off guard. How do you fight with Ron Goldman, a karate expert to some degree? who's got 20 some odd stab wounds, who's fighting for his life. He's got bruises. You guys can see all the bruising here. He was, you guys can look, look at the, look at the, um, the bruises on his knuckles. Hits were landing guys. Hits were definitely landing. Whose knuckles? There's marks on the bottom of Goldman's tennis shoes. There's a mark across the canvas top of it where he's trying to kick out, trying to defend himself in the karate motions in the defensive posture that he's been taught. And you guys can see, like I showed you guys earlier, the blood on the leg. How did he get stabbed in the leg like that? He was fighting. Charles, you've had a chance to look at the crime scene pictures as much as we could really give you. Medic and trained karate expert Charles England has studied the Goldman fight. Bill wants Charles to show him how he thinks the fight occurred. Come on in, Jason. Let's, I want to demonstrate what's happening in the fight scene. Ron Goldman comes by here. He's surprised by a strike. He's blocking. He's coming in. The assailant's right here. He's defending himself. He's striking. The assailant's coming down, trying to overbear on him. He's coming in. I'm stabbing. He leans back to the sidekick. Boom. He gets struck. He comes back in. One, two. He's struck in. And three. Would there be any wounds or any marks on your body based on what Goldman has just done to defend himself and protect his life? If there were bruise marks on the knuckles, what would that be indicative of to you as a professional? He struck him. He struck, struck him, him multiple times. Stick your hands up to strike him. I would say there would be strike wounds in here and to the facial area. Reading the autopsy report, he had bruises around these two knuckles and somewhat the third, meaning he sunk his fist into the man. Yeah. Like, they're, they're, you can't fake that, guys. You know what I mean? You are definitely doing some fucking uh, Finish him. type shit if you're – um. and obviously this is a fight for your life. Adrenaline is pumping, you know? And I was trained when I was in the law enforcement academy, guys, that when you're dealing with a knife uh, and a knife fight, right, the adrenaline a lot of times you won't even know you've been stabbed. All you feel is like something warm, okay? And that's your blood, obviously, but 
your adrenaline is going crazy. He's punching the fuck out of this guy. You don't get bruises like that on your um on your knuckles without being in a serious fight. Like I said before, the cut on the leg. How are you going to get that? By he was probably fighting, kicking, etc. and the guy was stabbing the leg, okay? And then you could see crazy blood all over the place in that area and where they were fighting. Could I have done this fight without any bruises whatsoever on my body, what would be the least I could walk away from? The least you could walk away from um, would maybe be a black eye, some bruised ribs, maybe even broken ribs. But when Simpson was examined shortly after the murders, no injuries or bruises were found. Not even a day later, guys. You know, literally, this is the next day. Uh, he comes, he flies right back uh, from L.A., uh, from uh, Chicago. Except for three small cuts on his left hand. Simpson has given various answers about the cuts, from a broken glass in his hotel room in Chicago to wrestling with his son. Forensic pathologist Dr. Werner Spitz viewed the photographs and testified in court against Simpson. These were not glass cuts. And uh, what they were were fingernail marks. How did they happen? He held her with his arm around her neck she, with her long acrylic fingernails, tried to get his arm off, inflicting those wounds, which by location on the fingers corresponded to that kind of a grasp. But even if they were fingernail marks, Goldman or Nicole couldn't have caused them. Goldman's nails were too short. And though analysis of Nicole's acrylic nails did show blood, it wasn't Simpson's. It pointed to someone else with a different blood group. Guys, that is fucking huge. Huge. I'm going to rewind that for y'all one more time. Okay? That's a bombshell of evidence. You know, and obviously the defense was able to use this to their advantage. But let's get play it one more time for y'all. Because I want you guys to really take that in. So, the marks on OJ's fingers are more indicative of being scratched. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and rewind this so you guys really get this. Location on the fingers corresponded to that kind of a grasp. But even if they were... By location on the fingers of inflicting she with her long acrylic fingernail. She with her long acrylic fingernails tried to get his arm off, inflicting those wounds, which by location on the fingers corresponded to that kind of a grasp. But even if they were fingernail marks, Goldman or Nicole couldn't have caused them. Goldman's nails were too short. And though analysis of Nicole's acrylic nails did show blood, it wasn't Simpson's. It pointed to someone else with a different blood group. Blood group type B. That's important, guys. So whoever she got, she dug into them as she was defending herself into their uh, um, into their hand or whatever she was able to grab, scratch the hell out of them. And I'm going to pull up a picture of her nails for y'all right here in a second. Um, she was wearing some white tips and white uh, French tip nails. And she was able to go ahead and obviously get some of that blood under her nail. And it was not OJ's. That is huge, guys. That is huge. So now we got the cap, right? The hat that has African-American hair fibers. However, it's not OJ's. And we got blood under Nicole Simpson's fingernails. That is not OJ's. So that in itself is exculpatory. Let's go into part three here. Like the video, by the way. Hope you guys are enjoying this. ...wasn't bruised as expected, and the fingernail evidence pointed away from him. There were more contradictions, too. The police and the prosecution were adamant that Simpson had carried out the murder in a spontaneous fit of jealous rage. And yet they also believed that Simpson wore the gloves that had been found, suggesting a premeditated attack. But even this wasn't the most disturbing aspect of the police case. There were serious questions about the reliability of the evidence against Simpson at the crime scenes. One of the world's most respected forensic analysts is Dr. Henry Lee. Acting for the defense, he examined the scenes at first hand. 
Uh, Henry Lee, legend when it comes to blood splatter type evidence, etc. testified in several uh, trials. This is, I think, one of the few times he actually testified on the behalf of the defense. Um, you know, and that goes to show you guys the power of OJ's defense team. Uh, Shapiro was able to get Henry to, to testify on their side. Um, and, you know, he, he gave some compelling testimony and that aided the defense to show that, um, you know, again, guys, the job of the defense is to go ahead and create reasonable doubts. Okay. That is their job. Create reasonable doubt uh, for the prosecution. So uh, let's play this and see what he was able to find. There are certain principles, crime scene principle, basic procedure violated. Everybody together step all over the place and step into the blood. That's why the problem star the contamination of the scene. The crucial issue in the case is walk all over the blood. Now you regenerate, redistribute all this pattern so the DNA grouping could be erroneous. Shoe print pattern in that little area becomes so complicated. So many different patterns there, you really cannot tell which one from who. Peter Harper is a British specialist in this field and has reviewed the police handling of the scenes. He's a and that was something that was criticized significantly um, with the LAPD, how they handled the evidence, carelessness, contamination. This was a big part of the defense's angle to go ahead and attack the defense. And guys, this is why chain of custody is so important. This is why um, evidence procedure in general with law enforcement agencies all over the country were revolutionized by this investigation because the defense was able to attack something that typically is unchallengeable, forensic evidence, guys, based on the fact that it was contaminated. Astonished by the disregard of basic procedure. Or the allegation that it was contaminated, excuse me. There's about seven to nine officers milling up and down that path, and it still hasn't been forensically examined or cleared. I mean, it's atrocious, that should never ever been allowed to happen. Now there's a, the view here of the coroner's officer. He's now at the top of the steps. So he's walked through the blood. Okay, so guys, I have a graphic photo here that I'm gonna show you guys. Um, and this is uh, Nicole Simpson's nails. I was able to find one. This was actually a very difficult photo to show you guys, but I'm gonna go ahead and show it here off to the side, right? So you guys don't have to see the face there, but there's her nails, okay? As you guys can see, there's a significant amount of blood there obviously from her getting cut but there's also some blood there that um from the attacker okay uh so this was taken obviously on the day of the uh of the attack over the body he's standing on the top step of the passage which once again the blood under her nails were not oj's guys a very important fact which again could either be the route of the murder coming in or going out and he's leaning up against railings he's got his foot against the wall he's rubbing valuable evidence away and again introducing evidence to that scene the catalog of errors goes on according to henry lee blood that had quite clearly dripped onto nicole's back could very well have been the killers it was never even collected this on her back those passive dripping clearly indicate could be another individual's blood. Could be Ron Goldman's, could be the suspects. That's why it's so crucial for solving case to reconstruct the case. That seven drop of blood should collect. However, the moment you turn the body out, that seven drop is gone. The moment you put the body in the body, that seven drop will lost forever. Peter Harper and colleague Terry Marston found yet more violations. And this is the importance of preserving the crime scene, guys, especially murder investigations. You only get that crime scene one time, okay? So you need to be able to collect everything that you need to collect. No one gets moved. No one gets touched until everyone is able to, until they're able to properly photograph it. They're properly able to collect uh, uh, swab samples. They're properly able to get DNA samples, blood samples, um, bodily fluids, whatever the hell is there at the scene. and the coroner is not supposed to come in until way later until the detectives and the forensic team are 100% done and do what they need to do. Of procedure. 
Ideally, you should have separate teams for each incident, and none of those teams should come into contact with one another, so that if you have a potential murder scene at Rockingham, it must be kept completely separate from Bundy Drive, and equally so the vehicle that was involved. That should also be treated as a separate scene, and it clearly hasn't been done, so you've cross-contaminated all three scenes. There are also major concerns about the blood evidence in the Bronco being contaminated. Incredibly, a number of officers who had been at the Bundy crime scene were reported to have been inside the Bronco before it had been examined. And one of those officers had looked after Nicole's dog, whose blood-stained paws had originally led people to the victims. So that's another issue there as well, right? Because you, now you're having chain of custody issues. You don't know whose blood is what, where it came from, etc. So it starts to mess up the ability to recreate the crime scene. And the dog was the original person, person, the original um, signifier that Nicole had been murdered, guys. She got murdered somewhere around uh, ten, between ten thirty ish to eleven ish, and she didn't, her body wasn't discovered until midnight because the dog was barking and neighbors had found the dog with blood on its paws and the dog led them back to Nicole. The fact that he got into the vehicle is to prove that he visited the scene. He's contaminated that vehicle. Therefore, all that evidence, it isn't evidence. It's corrupt evidence. It's, 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 there is no validity to that evidence. If you went to the Crown Prosecution Services with that type of evidence, it wouldn't see the light of day. It certainly wouldn't go to court and it certainly wouldn't see a prosecution. Remarkably, just 36 hours after the murders, the Bundy Drive crime scene was washed down. But Oh shit, wow. <laughs> That's kind of quick. Was this a case of bad police practice? Or was the well, also keep in mind, guys, that they had an enormous amount of pressure on them because cameras were all over the place. So they were kind of in a rush to go ahead and process the crime scene. But there are cameras there pretty much damn near 24-7 uh, watching what the hell was going on. So that also, you know, you got to look at it objectively from both sides. You know, yes, were the police rushed? Of course, right? But, uh, you know, did the police do a sloppy job? Yes. Um, but were the press staring being a pain in the fucking ass? Yes. You know? Um, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. The evidence actively tampered with or even planted to help their case against Simpson. There were two pieces of crucial and damning evidence against him. Nicole's blood was found spattered on a pair of Simpson's socks in his bedroom. And blood was found on the back gate at Nicole's house three weeks after the scene had been washed down, which provided the best match by far to Simpson's DNA at the murder scene. So three weeks later, okay, guys. So that's 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 uh that's a little wait. What's going on here? What that they found that. But during the criminal trial, the defense requested that second test be done on the blood from the socks and the gate. This time, they both revealed traces of a preservative called EDTA. EDTA is used by forensic scientists to stop blood clotting in the test tube. It cannot occur naturally in blood. The sock test showed that EDTA was found only in the blood stains and not in the rest of the socks. And the gate test had the same results. EDTA was found only in the blood stains and not in the control samples taken from the gate. For Terry Merston and Peter Harper, there is only one interpretation. There cannot be any other explanation with EDTA in the blood that it's been put there. Because it doesn't occur naturally just specifically in the spots of blood and not on the socks. Say for argument's sake that you could get EDTA in, in soap powder or something like that. Well, if, if that was possible, then that would explain the EDTA in the blood because it was in the socks. But when the socks haven't got EDTA or any sign of it, but the blood has, it speaks for itself. And that right there, guys, okay, was what the defense was able to use to articulate, oh, they planted evidence because their the defense argument was, yo, these guys have blood, right, that has EDTA in it, a preservative used for lab testing so the blood doesn't clot. How the hell is it at these crime scenes with EDTA in it? This doesn't make sense. They planted the evidence, okay? 
So now, is there a plausible explanation for this? Yes, there is to a degree. As you guys know, I keep it objective on this uh, on this bad boy. So I'm going to go ahead and play uh, two different perspectives here with the um, with the blood situation. Okay, and I have it right here. Okay, this is the the science portion of it. And as you guys can see, we got a lot to go over. We're going to talk about you know OJ Simpson. Uh, if I did it, his book. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk, we're going to go through where the crimes actually occurred real time with video, uh, more of the documentary. This is going to be probably one of the most thorough breakdowns of the OJ Simpson case on YouTube in modern day. Okay. Yes, I am saying that. So let's go ahead and, uh, you know, talk about this EDTA uh, controversial talking point that the defense was able to actually effectively use to help OJ and get off. Pause off on murder charges the prosecution's case relies in part on a trail of blood a trail they say that leads to oj simpson's guilt the defense claims the trail leads to sloppy police work bad science and perhaps something more sinister do you have an opinion on whether based on those chromatograms there is edta present in the stain from the back gate in my opinion, yes, it demonstrates that there is EDTA present in that stain. EDTA is a preservative. According to forensic toxicologist Frederick Readers, it's present in two blood stains, one found at the scene of the crime, the other on O.J. Simpson's socks. Why would those stains contain a preservative? The defense offers an explanation. The day after the murders, O.J. Simpson willingly gave a sample of his blood to police. It was stored in test tubes containing EDTA. The defense says someone in the LAPD must have taken blood from one of the test tubes and planted it. But the prosecution points out readers didn't do any experiments on the blood stains himself. And the investigator who did, FBI Special Agent Roger Martz, directly contradicts readers. I concluded based on the work that I'd done on the 19th, the 22nd, and the 28th, that... The blood stains in question did not come from preserved blood. They did not come from blood that was preserved with EDTA. And there's another complication. EDTA also is found in everyday products like food and laundry detergent. If the blood on the sock found in O.J. Simpson's house contains EDTA, could it have come from detergent? Dr. Readers says no. Did Agent Martz of the FBI uh, test an area of the sock that did not have any apparent blood on it. Yes, that's that, what he states he did. Did that indicate the presence of EDTA? No, it did not. And what does that tell you about the blood stain? Well, that means, since it is my opinion that the, the blood stain contained EDTA, that that came from the blood and not from the sock. If jurors aren't buying the planted evidence theory, the defense has another, contaminated evidence. John Gerdes, a molecular biologist, offers this sweeping indictment of the facility where most of the evidence was tested. And, and let me just make this extremely clear. The fact that the defense was able to call someone to go ahead and go against the FBI's, um, you know, blood test, which they keep in mind, they actually tested the blood from the actual crime scene versus the defense's witness had not. OK, and then they're able to bring in this guy as an expert witness. And you guys are going to see what he also says. This goes to uh, goes to speak the incredible skill of O.J. Simpson's team at diluting the, at the prosecution's case. OK, remember, guys, the defense's job is not to prove that the client is innocent. Their job is to prove that the client could be innocent. You see the difference there? Again, the, pro the defense's job is not to prove that their client is innocent. Their job is to prove that their client could be innocent because U.S. law, right, is big on innocent until proven guilty, and they would rather let a criminal walk free than imprison an uh, innocent man, okay? So that is what the law is, you know, it, it's, that's how it's supposed to be. And if you have a good defense team, that's how it's going to be, okay? That's why it's so important to hire your own counsel versus getting public defendants. They're going to go the extra mile to bring... Um, expert witnesses like this that can go ahead and do what? Dilute the prosecution's case. All right.
The LAPD laboratory has a substantial contamination problem that is persistent and uh, substantial. Is it chronic? It is chronic, and it's chronic in the sense that it uh, doesn't go away. I can find it month after month, and uh, it persists. Gerdes conducted an independent investigation of the crime lab's procedures and performance. He found half to all of the tests performed there have problems. I found uh, that the specimen handling procedures uh, were done in such a manner that it had a tremendous, there was a tremendous risk of, of the potential of this cross-contamination. The prosecution counters pointing out not all the tests were performed by the LAPD. Blood samples also were sent to two outside laboratories, Cellmark Diagnostics and the State Justice Department. Test and this is a pretty fair, um, you know, the rebuttal by the uh, prosecution. Performed at these labs also point to Simpson as the prime suspect. The defense now returns to the scene of the crime, using forensic science to attack the prosecution's timeline theory. Their witness, Dr. Michael Bodden, brings impressive credentials. Besides investigating the deaths of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., he helped convict the man who killed civil rights leader Medgar Evers. Today, he testifies about the brutal deaths of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. What is the basis for your opinion that there was a struggle between Nicole Brown Simpson and her assailant or assailants prior to the time she died? Well, because there were about uh, nine or ten stab wounds and cut wounds on her body before she suffered the fatal uh, uh, injury. The point of all this is to show the murders took a lot longer to commit than the two or three minutes granted by the prosecution. If the defense can show the murders took five, ten, or fifteen minutes, O.J. Simpson's window of opportunity closes. Remember, according to the limo driver, Simpson was back at his estate at 1055 that night. If Ronald Goldman... Be because he had to catch the flight to Chicago. And remember, we know that it's about two miles, right, from Rockingham to, uh, to Bundy. So, you know, it's a five-minute drive, but would he have had time to murder them, get in the car, run back home, change, then come down and meet his limo driver? That's where it gets shaky began a struggle with his assailants at 10.40 p.m. Within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, can you tell us when the stab wound to the chest would have occurred? My opinion would be at least five minutes, uh, more likely around 10 minutes after the neck started to bleed. Are the defense calls Dr. Henry Lee. Finally, the internationally renowned forensic scientist, Dr. Henry Lee, takes center stage for the defense. Hired by Robert Shapiro right after the murders, Lee is considered the nation's top forensic investigator, credited with solving 5,000 crimes. He's also famous for his courtroom theatrics. University of New Haven, uh, you know, named one of their buildings after him, okay, because they have actually a forensic... Uh, major there uh, at UNH. Dr. Lee's tutorial style and obvious expertise hold the jurors rapt attention, and his testimony isn't always grim. Was Mr. Blazier there? Leading, Your Honor. Sustain. Oh, maybe him. I, you all look alike. I don't know. <laughs> but the defense has a serious reason for putting Lee on the stand to explain three sets of mysterious parallel lines found at the crime scene. The defense suggests they're the shoe prints of a second killer. The prosecution says that's nonsense. And the only detectable footprints are those from a pair of Bruno Mali shoes, which they contend Simpson wore when he committed the murders. Lee's testimony is cautious. If this parallel line imprint comes from a shoe, could it be the Bruno Magli shoe? No. It would be some other shoe. If this is a shooter, this is a different type of design. And this shoe is going to come into play in the civil case. And Bruno Mike. But Lee never says definitively the lines are shoe prints. And a couple of weeks after appearing in court, Lee holds a news conference to announce he'll no longer testify for the defense. One time experience, it's more than enough. Life have to go on besides O.J. Simpson case. It's a sentiment members of the jury probably share.
parts per the million. The D1S80 typing 2, 000, result consistent with Mr. Simpson. Blood. The jury has been overwhelmed with scientific evidence. Can you DNA. see that the moisture has spread DNA. out from that the control swatch? That those samples are contaminated. And by scientists. Now the jury must decide who's... So as you guys can see, there was a significant amount of conflicting evidence from the forensics, which hurt the um, the prosecution because the problem, the thing with forensic evidence is it's supposed to stand on its own and be indisputable, but the defense was able to attack the, um, the procedures, the collection, the contamination, and regardless of if the LAPD did everything correctly, all the defense has to do is cause reasonable doubt, guys, okay? Remember, remember, it's on the prosecution to prove it's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's on the defense to create that reasonable doubt. Someone must have put it there. The blood evidence in Simpson's Bronco was also crucial to the case against him. Two days after the murders, the car was tested. Simpson's blood was found, but there were also traces of both victims' blood. Particularly noticeable were the blood stains on the center console labeled as items 30 and 31. Item 30 was found to be only Simpson's blood. But like the sample from the gate, when the blood evidence in the Bronco was re-examined three months later, it had also changed. In particular, the results from the console were now very different. Item 30, re-labeled as 303 and 306, was now found to be a mixture of Simpson's, Ron Goldman's and Nicole's blood. Guys, and this is a nightmare. Um, you don't want things changing up on you when you're trying to build a criminal case, okay? Relabeling things, results coming back different. Uh, this is this is a no bueno, man, because this hurts the validity of the case. You always want to get it done the right the first time when it comes to prosecution, forensics, evidence, etc., because it gives the defense wiggle room to go ahead and challenge the way the the, the um the evidence was collected and this is how uh, uh Simpson was able to beat these charges not only that he also had a star team by the way guys this was his defense team right here um just to show y'all real fast this was his defense team uh, you know you can see Shapiro Johnny Cochran uh Bailey's not in here but this is so, th this is his defense team which was it cost him i think it was 10 million altogether his his defense cost him um where are we at here um yeah there we uh where's the there we go there's there's all of them together i think this is bailey right here there's kardashian i mean yeah dude johnny cochran this was an incredible team uh that they put together all of these guys were seasoned um attorneys you know you got johnny Co right you got shapiro who was the um, considered the architect because he's the one that created the team. You got Johnny Cochran with his famous phrase, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Robert Kardashian, obviously a close friend of Simpson. Simpson was living at his house at the time. Uh, F. Lee Bailey joined the defense team before the preliminary hearing and handled many of the defense team's press conferences. Bailey's most notable contribution to defense was his cross-examination of LAPD investigator uh, Mark Furman. You know, he was able to get him to plead the fifth, right, which is crazy for a detective to take the fifth in a criminal trial crazy stuff. Alan Dershowitz uh, was a Felix Frankfurter professor emeritus at Harvard Law and <clears throat> as 2013 remained one of the most successful lawyers and legal scholars in the country. After representing uh, Simpson, he was uh, he represented Julian Assange, Jeffrey Epstein, and Harvey Weinstein. He's also served as a member of the legal team for President Donald Trump during his first impeachment trial. Um, he's written multiple books. Barry Sheck, a law professor at the Benjamin N. C uh, Cordazzo School of Law in New York City, Forensic expert. Uh, Sheck is known for his work as co founder and co director of the Innocent Project, a nonprofit organization that uses DNA evidence to clear the names of wrongfully convicted uh, inmates. This guy was instrumental at attacking the, the, the defense's uh, forensic evidence. You know, you got Peter Newfield joined the Simpson defense team to assist with underlying the uh, undermining the prosecution's DNA and forensic evidence. Um, he is perhaps best known for discrediting the credibility of the blood trail between Nicole Simpson's body and OJ Simpson's car. Another guy that was also. Huge in discrediting the uh, the um, the prosecution's uh, you know strategy, which was heavily heavily relying upon forensic evidence and blood. Um, and then you got Gerald F. Ullman was part of O.J.'s defense team during the O.J. Simpson murder uh, case. 
Uh, he says he devised the uh, memorable line used by Johnny Cochran in the closing argument. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. So he's the one that came up with it. So, guys, this this is pro- the, some of the best defense money can buy. He literally had a team that overwhelmed the prosecution in experience, skill. Uh, you know, they used they used uh, a lot of dirty tactics, right? They used the race card quite a bit in this trial. They were able to appeal to the emotion of the jury, which was had a bunch of black jurors on there, black females to be exact. Um, and you know, they, they were able to do it. They were able to do it. They were able to discredit the investigators. They were able to discredit the evidence. They were able to cause enough reasonable doubt, even in an investigation where it was very obvious that OJ was involved in this thing. This, this was, this, this was a case guys of the defense, right? The prosecution not showing up. It's not that the defense won. It's that the prosecution lost. All right. 304 and 305 also differed from the original analysis. And 305 could only have been made with a hand wet with fresh blood. Bam. So how did the stains get there? If they were made by either of Simpson's hands, then the hands had to be covered in blood from both himself and the victims. But if that's the case, then everything else he touched, like the door handle, steering wheel, or light switch, should also be smeared with the same mixture. But these smears are all just Simpson's blood alone. If the stains were made with Simpson's right hand and he was still wearing the glove, then the finger area of the glove should have his blood on the fingertips as well as blood from the victims. However, Simpson's blood is not found on the fingertips at all, nor is that mixture of all three of them found anywhere else in the vehicle. We both think that that blood, those finger marks, were put on that console at a later time. They were not on that console at the time of the murder. The area they're in, I would say, is impossible for those finger marks to be put onto that console without either the console being removed or the seat being removed. And the reason I say that is because the finger marks, if they were facing downwards, you might say, OK, that's a possibility. But they're not. The finger marks are facing upwards. It's an awkward angle. With the right hand. Unless you've got an extremely flexible wrist and you can turn your hand at right angles. It's got to be your left hand, which means the elbow and forearm have got to be below the hand. They wouldn't be able to do it because they wouldn't get their elbow and forearm low enough for their hand to put the finger marks in that position. So with serious doubts over the blood from the Bronco, the gate and the socks, does this mean that the police were actively sweetening the case against Simpson? Numerous allegations have now surfaced about... See, and the defense can use that and run with it, guys. That's what they do. They take a little piece of information like that, and it's off to the races. Police are corrupt. They're planning evidence, blah, blah, blah. But LAPD officers planting evidence. Detective Mark Furman, the racist officer who discovered some of the most important clues, was involved in cases where suspects were beaten and reports were falsified. Questioned under oath, he pleaded the Fifth Amendment the only way in an American court to avoid giving an answer. The Fifth Amendment, guys, is basically the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself. That is the Fifth Amendment in a nutshell. Detective Furman, uh, have you ever falsified a police report? And this is Bailey right here going ahead. And, um, you know, this is an iconic moment in the trial when this happened. And I remember when Furman had to come in and give this testimony. Right. Remember, guys, they leaked some tapes. Okay, so long story short, let's rewind this real fast so you guys understand what the hell's going on here. All right. So they leaked some tapes of Furman saying some racist things, okay? Dropping an N-bomb, saying we got to kill the N-bombs, etc. blah, 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 right? And the thing is, is that these tapes came from him auditioning for some type of acting role of some kind or some audio book or something like that. It was some kind of, he was auditioning for something. And... The tapes were made um, available to the defense in the middle of the trial, okay? And they were able to actually introduce these tapes, okay, as um, pieces of evidence in the trial. However, key distinction here, the judge, okay, and I want you guys to also understand this too, that this is very, very, very important. You guys got to understand that the jury did not see nearly as much of what the trial was actually covered by the media. One more time for y'all. Please understand this. What was documented on the trial on television, okay, 
The jury saw a fraction of that. So the jury did not see this testimony you guys are about to see right now with Furman taking the fifth as a detective in a criminal case. The jury did not see this. The jury, however, did listen to fragments of the racist comments, okay, during the trial. They did listen to fragments of it. Again, in context, from what I understand, what I've been told, these racist comments came from him auditioning for some type of acting role or some kind of audio book, something to do like that. But again, with his background, with him being involved in situations where there was potential misconduct with other uh, officers, not necessarily himself, but he was involved in it, makes him look bad. And that's all the defense has to do is question your integrity and your candor. And then as soon as you are seen, deemed to be non-credible, that's a nightmare for the prosecution. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and play this right here. I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? I assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Crazy. And this is Lee F. Bailey right here, guys. As you can see, after the verdict, here he is right here. He's the one that was um, cross-examining Furman there with, with the... Uh, with the tapes because the thing is, is that Furman fucked up by saying he's never been racist or used racist comments towards black people ever. And then these tapes come out. Obviously he can't sit there now and answer questions because they're going to look crazy. Even if it was for some type of auditioning or whatever, the question was, have you ever used these terms before? And he was basically responding in the, you know, no, I never have. Okay. And then the tapes come out, makes him look crazy. doesn't matter what context under which he said it. He could technically be considered lying. Now, could he have answered the questions and maybe not been charged or whatever? Yeah, but he's there with his counsel. His counsel's like, fuck no, don't say nothing. Just, it is what it is, bro. Take the L. You're not going to open up the door for them to potentially come after you and hit you with perjury. So that's why he decided to take the, the fifth. Even if him using those words were in the context of some kind of art or acting or whatever the hell, he said under oath prior test in prior testimony, I have never used those terms and I am not a racist. And that's what the defense was able to do to attack his credibility. And there were other disturbing aspects to the police evidence. Simpson's defense team also alleged that some of the blood taken by the police after his interview had gone missing. And they discovered that all the main blood samples were taken away by one detective. See, it just looks bad, guys, right? It just looks bad. Just sloppy police work. We learned in the criminal trial that a lead detective had a vial of Mr. Simpson's blood. That alone, in any other case less controversial than this, would have been enough to have, have the case. Would, If that had been discovered as it was here, then the case would be over, literally. But we learned in the civil case, which went against Mr. Simpson, Nevertheless, we learned that that same senior detective had gone to the coroner's and asked for and received samples of the victim's blood. And therefore, the blood of all the principles, that's 100% of the blood types found in this case, on the fence, on the ground, on gloves, on socks, on clothing, in the car, the universe of blood in this case, samples of which were in the hands of senior, at least one senior detective, thus violating the chain of evidence, absolutely, violating every safeguard, every tradition, every expectation on the part of the prisoner at the bar. Yeah, this, this, this right here, you know, again, you attack the evidence, you hurt, you destroy the case. Not admitted freely, but dug out by a highly active and aggressive defense team. Simpson, would you please stand and face the jury? Again, goes back to what I was saying. The defense won this case, man. Sorry, the prosecution lost this case. The defense held on. So despite Simpson's blood at the scene and his lack of an alibi, there are now reasonable doubts about the evidence at all three crime scenes. Superior Court. Of and that's all they have to do. Create reasonable doubt. That's the defense's job, guys. Remember, it's not to prove that their client is innocent is to prove that their client could be innocent. California County of Los Angeles 
In the matter of the people of When the verdict Korea, came, America stopped to watch, and the result split the nation. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant or Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Crazy. Some hailed the result as a victory over a system that would do anything to secure a conviction. His defense team believed that there was a wider pattern of police corruption. Wild. Whatever evidence may have been manipulated, a year later Simpson faced another trial, this time in the civil courts. In this case, brought by the victim's families, dramatic new evidence emerged. The main set of bloody footprints by the bodies and down the path to the rear was made by a style of Bruno Magli shoes, of which there were only 300 pairs sold in the United States. Under oath, Simpson denied owning a pair. A photographer in Buffalo, New York, where Simpson played football for the better part of his career, uh, heard about his testimony regarding the shoes and started rummaging through photographs that he had of O.J. Simpson. And sure enough, he has this picture of Simpson wearing what appear to be these Bruno Magli shoes. Oh, and shit. What's remarkable about the photograph is that you could actually see the soul. <laughs> that is high quality shit right there, my friends. O.J., that's an L. Simpson was re reported in the uh, article as saying it was a complete fraud. It was laughable. Somebody doctored the picture with digital equipment, and that is not the shoes that, that he wore that day. Right before the end of the trial, another photographer in Buffalo came forward with 30 more photographs of Simpson wearing the same shoes on the same day. And to top it off, a photo included in that group of 30 of him wearing the shoes was published in a newspaper put out by the Buffalo Bills organization nine months before the murders. So now we had the photo in a newspaper, a matter of public record, meaning it was impossible for anybody to have doctored these photos. Which go, obviously was one of the biggest pieces of evidence. And here's the shoe print comparison. This is from the crime scene. This is a test impression of the shoe size 12. And here's the shoe print from the actual crime scene. And definitely, OJ, got to give yourself that. Bam. And yes, sir, that is definitely a face palm. <laughs> Simpson lost the case and was ordered to pay the families of the victims millions of dollars. Holy! The family's lawyers had successfully argued to the civil trial jury that Simpson owned a pair of Bruno Magli shoes. So could Simpson have been at the crime scene with or after someone else? And there you go. And he had to pay, if I'm not mistaken, $33 million to the family, guys. Um, which I don't think he paid any of it because his NFL pension, which pays him about twenty k per month, 20 to 25 k per month, they can't touch that. And, you know, obviously he went to jail for a significant amount of time for trying to steal back some memorabilia. So, Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, man, that's an L. And remember, guys, civil cases, remember, preponderance of the evidence. It's not to the same level of uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Preponderance of the evidence. And this is evidence that did not come into the criminal case, uh, the Bruno Magli shoes. Dr. Henry Lee believes he has found evidence that supports the idea of two people at the murder scene. We're getting somewhere now. At the scene, we notice another set of the shoe prints. Also on the Bundy walkway, with parallel line design, it's a smaller size, about 10 and a half. It's not one, it's quite a few, which indicative that's a trail. It's not a random deposit. Dr. Lee was told that none of the shoe prints from the police officers or other officials. The closed caption and doing our boy, Dr. Lee, dirty. You guys might have to rewind that part. <laughs> <laughs> the scene matched this parallel line design. It could be a second person. Another suspect. That's a possibility. Could be a witness. 
another possibility. Simpson's defense team also unearthed a third possible shoe print, this time leaving the scene heading on to Bundy Drive. So is there an explanation that makes sense of all this evidence that points away from Simpson as the killer and yet explains the footprints and the blood at the scene? Private eye Bill Deere thinks he has some answers and tonight reveals his findings. From watching the trial, there's no doubt in my mind he came to the crime scene. But to me, he came after the murders. Deer wondered whether anyone else... Could... All right, so let's see his theory here, guys. And then I'll give my theory after. ...that caused Simpson to go to the scene. After investigating other possible suspects, he honed in on just one. Simpson's son from his first marriage, Jason. Then I picked up... Oh, and shit. Myself... Now we're getting somewhere. I said, find out if there's any record at the police department of Jason Lamar Simpson ever being interviewed by the police department. I said, no, they never interviewed him. I said, what? Are you really telling me they never interviewed him? Never interviewed him. So I said, okay, I've got to look further. I go down to the city and I look up criminal records. I found that at the day of the murders, that Jason Lamar Simpson was on probation. Deer discovered that Jason, a chef, had been put on probation for a violent attack on an employer, Paul Goldberg. He also found that Jason had other convictions, including drunken driving and hit and run. Man, these celebrity kids always be doing some dumb shit, bro. Like, just stupid. You know, you grow up, you know, silver spoon in your mouth. Dad is an NFL star, making quite a bit of money. You doing this dumb shit as an adult, chef. You know, again, in fights, drunk driving, all this other stupid shit, man. This is why, okay, this is just my opinion. If you have a son or whatever, bro, you got to you gotta raise that dude as if you're poor or something like that, man. The kid, these kids be spoiled, act crazy. Great. <laughs> What's your found out? Dear and colleague Herman King tracked down Mrs. Goldberg, who witnessed the attack. But she said he worked for us about three or four months. And uh, one day he called in and said, I can't come in. I'm sick. And then two of the other cooks came in and said, Hey, I saw Jason at a basketball game. Next day, Jason shows up and said, um, I, uh, I'm i back to work now. Uh, I think I'm going to quit, and I want to be paid for being off, for being sick. And Paul said, no. I he gives him big, nope, you ain't getting no money, bro. I'm not going to pay you for being off. You were at a basketball game. He said, you're going to pay me. He said, lining up. He said you're going to pay me. You owe me. And Paul said, no, I'm not going to pay you, and turned to walk away and said all of a sudden jason came run up behind him and hit him from the back and was hitting from the back and when he fell down jason was stomping with his foot uh, next thing you know he reached for a knife one of the uh, kitchen knives or chef knives right. oh shit and she said the police were called oh, shit. Oh, shit. and said uh, jason was arrested and um the charges were filed when they went to court she said that the charges were lowered to a misdemeanor but he was uh, fined and placed on probation. Mm. After many... So there you go. You got some violent tendencies there. But but wait, there's more. Interviews with people who knew Jason. Deer discovered that he had a troubled past and a history of violence. Aged 15, Jason had even attacked a statue of his father with a baseball bat. For Deer, the key question now was whether Jason had a confirmed and convincing alibi. On the night of the murders, 24-year-old Jason was working as a chef at Jackson's restaurant in Beverly Hills. He was known by the people that worked there and pretty well liked too. And there's going to be a very eerie, you know, thing here with the restaurant and Nicole in a second. And this is a detective that worked the case as well. If I remember right. And... Um, as like most chefs, he had his own utensils, his knives, and as I remember, they were all accounted for. According to the police, Jason had a watertight alibi. He was cooking until late that evening. We've established that he was with people that spoke for him, that they were with him, and uh, his times were accounted for. So he was eliminated as a suspect very quickly. Well, I well, that, my friend... <laughs> 
<laughs> was not a good move because the I will give the private investigator this. He did some damn good work here, and you guys are going to hear in a second. Let's go. I've always taken a position. You never assume. You always verify. So I went to the restaurant. I then am talking to the waitresses, and I said, I was in on the 5th. I think it was the Sunday before, and I named the date because it was June 12th when, when the Colden were murdered. And I said, you had hardly anybody here. And she said, yeah, we were lucky we had 20, 25 people. We started closing right after uh, July on Sunday, lack of business. Well, all of a sudden, my mind's clicking, and I knew then that, hey. Sunday was the day that she was killed, guys. July, t June 12th, 1994. Something wrong. So how early did the restaurant shut that night? Deer tracked down a former waiter at Jackson's to find out. What time do you think they would have shut down if there was no business on June 12th? There no business like on Sunday. Even now we're a little busy, like 9.30, kitchen starts breaking down. If on Sunday night, June 12th, and there was only 20 to 25 people, then you'd shut down, what, 8.30, 9? 9. You leave her. And just so you guys know, here's a calendar from June of 1994. Bam, Sunday. June 12th, okay? And typically Sundays, a lot of the times, hey, man, they might be slower nights. So if the restaurant shut as early as 9, who could give Jason his alibi? As you guys can see, he's a pretty big dude. He ain't small. Jason himself has given an account of his movements on the night of the murders. He stated that his girlfriend, Jennifer Green, picked him up in his car around 10 to 10.30, and they drove to her apartment. He then dropped her off and went home, where he watched television until three in the morning. To verify Jason's story, his girlfriend's testimony would be crucial. He had packed her down to a fashion store in West Los Angeles. I located, finally, the girlfriend, Jennifer Green. I said, were you with him on the night of June 12th? Absolutely. She said, well, I was supposed to pick him up at 9.30, so I got there right at 9.30. And he came out, and he said, I'll be a few minutes. And he came out a little before quarter till 10. I said, what happened then? She said, well, he came out. I said, was he carrying anything? Oh, yeah, he carries his knives that he takes with him. Oh. Well, he's a chef, right? I said, oh, you're talking about his chef's knives? And he said, yes, his chef's knives. And he got into the Jeep, and we drove to my house. We got out and went upstairs to my apartment. I said, to what time? Oh, Mr. Beer, he was with me till after 11 o'clock. The two stories were in direct contradiction to each other. The times were different, and Jason stated that he never went up to her apartment, but Jennifer was adamant. She said, you can verify it from the time clock. You know, his time records will show what time we left. We left about 9.45. It was about a five minute drive from Jackson's restaurant to Jennifer's apartment and a further 15 to 17 minutes to drive to Nicole's house on Bundy Drive. So Jason could have been at the crime scene at around 10.15 that night, which was the earliest the police believed the murders could have occurred. With doubts over Jason's alibi, Bill Deere continues... So we got, we got, we got some uh, questions here, as you guys can see. Like, what's going on? And just so you guys know, just to give you guys a frame of reference here, Here's O.J. Simpson, okay, with uh, his fam, right? Here he is with, uh, here's Nicole. Here's his two children. I don't know who this kid is. And then here's um, Jason right here. We know um, O.J. is six foot one. His son here from looking probably around 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 okay? Bigger guy, clearly stout, okay? Has some weight on him. Not a weak guy, right? 24 years old at the time. to look into Jason's past, and in particular for a previous girlfriend, Dee Dee. What she said astonished him. It took me a couple years, but I found Dee Dee, and this is what Dee Dee told me. I dated him for quite a period of time. I liked him, but he had a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality. In fact, he tried to kill me. I went home one night, and Jason was mad. I had picked up Chinese food. He threw it at me, and I ran for my life, and he jumped on me, and he had in his hand one of his chef's knives. He took and pinned me there and reached down, and I thought he was going to kill me, but instead oh, he took oh, the knife, shit. and he cut off all my hair. <laughs> Could you imagine that shit? 
bitch. You order Chinese? You know who the fuck I am? You order fucking Chinese? I'm a chef. Who do you think you are? I'm going to kill you. Could you imagine that? Say how fucking mad he got. Chinese? This is an insult. Take out. You know who I am? I'm OJ's son. <laughs> he probably got tight. He was like, fuck this shit. How dare you fucking get some goddamn takeout on me, bitch? <laughs> I'm going to cut your hair now. Yo! <laughs> Dear and colleague Herman King found that Jason had a history of disturbed behavior, which began as early as 14 when he overdosed on cocaine. This is where it gets a little hairy. Right. They Very common with these celebrity kids, man. They out here doing drugs, having fun, not a care in the world, who gives a shit. Woo, yeah, OJ son, yeah, life is lit. Discovered that Jason had been a heavy drinker as well as using other drugs. Also found that he'd been placed in a mental institution for evaluation and that he'd attempted suicide three times. There's his Jeep. There's his Jeep. What's up, Jeff? One of Deer's methods is to go through people's rubbish. After <laughs> shout out to the British people that call it rubbish. Guys, the feds do this as well. The police do this as well. This is called the trash run. You learn a lot about people when you go through their trash, uh, surprisingly. Uh, I've done trash runs plenty of times when I was an agent. You get a lot of cool information from people uh, as far as like people that you're investigating. After examining Jason's rubbish for some time, he discovered that Jason was consuming a lot of alcohol and that he was taking a medicine called Depakote. Depakote is usually prescribed for seizures and a condition called rage disorder and should never be taken with alcohol. And after further research, they found that just six months before the murders, Jason said that he was losing control. Dear. And here we go. Uh, Depakote, okay. It can treat seizures and bipolar disorder. It also help prevent migraine headaches, okay? So, yeah, this, this, this guy, man, was fucking loco. Then discovered that Jason suffered from a condition called intermittent rage disorder. And because the murder showed signs of being rage killings, Deer wanted to find out how someone with the condition would behave. What it usually refers to is a person who has um, moments when they may tend to be very, very calm. And then for what they may consider good reason, they may move into a state of, of extreme rage and extreme kind of violence. Frequently, that diagnosis is associated with a seizure kind of disorder and the medication that's usually used is one that, that tends to control seizure activity. Now, two months prior to the murders of Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman, I know from a previous girlfriend that my suspect quit using his Depakote. And the girlfriend said, why are you not taking your Depakote anymore? And he said, the stuff is making me feel like shit. That what would you think then? If in fact he has seizure activity, then uh, uh, then he may be uh, just a, a walking time bomb. Dia then found that around the same time as that's crazy, guys. That's a volatile combination, man. Alcohol, drugs, mental issues, rage. Obviously, has an anger issue. Wanted to kill one of his girlfriends for ordering Chinese because he's a culinary chef. It was an insult to his culinary skill. No, I'm just kidding. But all jokes aside. The guy is has a recipe right here. It's a, it's a concoction for destruction. As Jason stopped taking Depakote, he'd made another attack, this time on girlfriend Jennifer Green. And that's the girl in the photograph that I showed you guys earlier. Headlines, OJ's son tries to kill girlfriend. I couldn't believe what I was reading. There it was, a picture of Jason, a picture of Jennifer Green, and a story where she admitted to friends that she was in fear of her life and that he had drugged her out of a car. And actually, Jason knocked her to the ground and was beating her. Dee Dee verified it. Dee Dee was there. He had his hands around her throat and was trying to choke her to death. Why didn't the police ever interview him? Because they were convinced that OJ was guilty.
which I'm not denying that OJ was guilty, but we're going to definitely do a little bit more investigating on this guy. And I got to give the private investigator his flowers on this one because he did a damn good job of researching the son, figuring out, you know, the son's background. And quite frankly, the son was involved in some shit. God damn it. I'm not. According to the police investigation, Jason had no motive. He was very quickly eliminated. He had alibis. Um, we knew his whereabouts. And, uh, uh, of course, you know, we're still looking at the ability to do the crime or the motive. The alibi was weak. Motive, we're going to talk about that here soon. And, and those things have to fit, and he, he was just eliminated very quickly, actually. All right, we'll go ahead into part five. But Bill Deere disagrees. He feels that Jason did have a possible motive. On the night of June 12th, Nicole Simpson, Justin, Sidney, and her entire family were scheduled to arrive not at Mesalona's, but at Jackson's Restaurant at 8908 Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills, California, for a dinner that was being prepared by Jason Simpson, OJ's son. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. But she never showed up. I wondered how it felt for a young man because in it, the question was asked, did you ever cook for them, for them before? No. You ever cooked for your dad before? No. Dad never has come to your restaurants where you work? No. Jason had to have been embarrassed that night laying out preparations. Damn, his girl's ordering Chinese takeout. His, you know, his stepmom don't want to come and eat at the restaurant until the day that she's, you know, she passed away. She couldn't even make it. Uh, OJ never goes to the restaurant. Man, he, my man is fucking tight, bro. He's like, yo, what the fuck? He's he probably going through a rage like, get over here. <laughs> For 11 people to come to Jackson's restaurant and nobody showing up. God, that had to hurt. And there was more. Jason had also been accused of stalking. He had followed ex-girlfriend Dee Dee after they had broken up. And even when she tried to get away from him, after the time he cut off all her hair, she went to New York. And guess who followed her? Jason. Jason used his father's apartment, OJ's, there in New York, to stalk her. Nicole also had complained of a stalker. Before she was murdered, Nicole told former police officer and family friend Ron Shipp that she thought it might have been Jason. When well, she called me about the prowler, she said there was two people. That's pretty big right there. The fact that she knew it was Jason is one of them. People that, that she thought it could have been. She said, she says, you know, she's, I'm not sure who it was. She says, it was either OJ or Jason. And I'm thinking, you know, here again, I'm thinking to myself, OJ or Jason. Yeah, like OJ, okay, you can see why, right? He obviously, it's his ex-wife. You know, he he's obviously interested in her not doing some ho shit outside, whatever. However, Jason, like, what? Hmm. What the fuck? Nicole had taken Jason out to various nightclubs. Could he have become infatuated with her? I mean, you got this this guy, she's taking him out dancing all the time, and they're having a great time, and, and um... But uh, yes, yeah, that's, that's always a possibility. And and like I said, I'll never forget that her saying that to me, you know, that she thought it was OJ or Jason. Jason declined to be interviewed for this film. Current I'm not fucking surprised. <laughs> hey, yo, Jason, we want, we're doing a documentary on uh, you and your dad, uh, you potentially being a murderer. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Nope. <laughs> the evidence that links him to the crime is circumstantial and there is no proof of his involvement the police failed to examine the inconsistencies in Jason's story but there was also another major line of inquiry that the authorities failed to follow believing that Simpson was the sole suspect okay now we're about to get into some really crazy conspiracy theories here guys um <laughs> but you know what we're here fuck it let's go ahead 
Let's go ahead and run all the, you know, all the different facts. We've went through, you know, the prosecution story, went through the defensive story, went through um, the private investigator story. Might as well go into this other potential chain of events that may have occurred as well. Let's do it. They also dismissed the leads provided by Nicole and Simpson's other life involving sex and drugs, which might have provided another motive for the murders. Yes, LAPD did definitely um, omit this information. This case is in the in the West End, or West LA, or West Hollywood. Drug usage is like tea. It's like coffee. So the drug issue was there, no question about that. Uh, and and the rage of the way the the homicide took place could also lead a reasonable person to conclude that it's got to be somebody crazy to uh, to do something like that. And guys, keep in mind, okay, Nicole married OJ at. She met OJ at 18 and was in a relationship with him until 1985, and then they got married. So her entire adult life, essentially, was her being with OJ in a monogamous relationship. They didn't really start having problems until the late 90s. So when she became single in the early 90s, right, with the divorce, oh, yeah, bam. And not to mention that, guys, she was getting paid $10,000 a month, okay? She had won a million-dollar settlement. And, excuse me, no. She had won $500,000. OK, from OJ. And then she had also was getting paid ten thousand dollars a month. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and do the numbers for y'all on that from in 1992. I'll go ahead and give you guys the inflation numbers on that here in a second. But it's a, the equivalent to about a uh, million dollars. A little. Uh, no, actually, you know what? I do remember. This is how crazy I I was doing so much research on this from inflation numbers. That's approximately today the purchasing power of a million, th- a million, a million fifty one thousand dollars as far as the money that she was given up front. And then on top of that, she was also given uh, paid tw- 10K a month, okay, in 1992, which is the equivalent of about $21,000 today, okay? So think about that. She became a millionaire, and then on top of that, she was making almost quarter million dollars a year passively in today's standards, okay? So, and she had a Ferrari. She was living life. She had that apartment that she was living in. She was chilling. So she was living a very, very high class life obviously the neighborhood that she was went in in Brentwood is uh, a high uh, uh, you know a, a very nice LA suburb okay so she was able to afford this lifestyle of being able to do what she wanted having drugs partying etc because she essentially got paid guys quarter million dollars a year in today's standards of course it was about 120,000 dollars a year back then uh but she was and she had a million dollars given up front from OJ Simpson that's not even counting alimony, by the way, guys. This was just from the divorce settlement in itself. This is not counting alimony. I don't even know how much alimony she was getting paid. I know $10,000 a month, aka $21,000 per month, and child support, okay? So she wasn't even working making this kind of money, all right? During the year before her death, Nicole and her friends were moving in drug-related circles. Metzaluna's restaurant was widely rumored to be a place to buy drugs, and Ron Goldman was alleged to sell them. What's more, just a year before the murders, Goldman's friend and nightclub owner Brett Cantor was killed in a similar savage knife attack. And other waiters working for the Metzaluna chain were murdered or went missing within 18 months. Bam. Hey. The drug game is cold, guys. That's why I tell y'all all the time, man. Stay away from drugs. I don't give a shit if you smoke weed, pop pill, whatever you do. Lean, I don't care. The drug game brings you around nefarious people. Even if you're doing it recreationally, you never know the people that you're involved in, how deep they are in the game, what kind of money they owe, what type of people they're involved in, what they may have seen, if they're snitching, whatever the hell it is. The drug game is violent, guys. And this is the 90s. This is the early 90s, by the way. In the early 90s, guys, I, you guys have seen me do breakdowns on documentaries on drug trafficking organizations in the 90s. They didn't give a fuck, man. Acts of violence were what they did, okay? Late 80s, early 90s, the cocaine crack epidemic. They, they didn't care, you know? Now, am I going to sit here and say that Nicole Simpson was a victim of a drug trafficking organization I decided to come in and kill Ron Goldman or whatever? I ain't going to go that far. But this definitely, you know, lets you kind of know the type of life that she was living. She was a single woman. Finally free, finally single, after years of being married to a man that she deemed as controlling, she's going to go wild. 
right? She's going to have her fun. She's going to go and do drugs. She's going to go and do, you know, have sex with a bunch of guys, go on dates, etc. OJ witnessed her having sex with a guy when he had went to try to get some box on one night. You know, he admits this in his book. Okay. So, um, you know, that obviously that admission would, would hurt him because it would make it look like, okay, now you have a motive to kill her. So I don't think he's lying about that. Simpson was also known to take cocaine. So could his or Nicole's involvement with drugs provide an explanation for the murders? And you guys can call me a lame, whatever. You, oh, Myron, you, you're just so anti-drug, blah, blah, blah. Hey, man, uh, maybe it's my background from what I used to do for a living, being a former Fed or whatever. But to me, I think drugs are whack. I don't see a, pos uh, a you know a need for them as a young man trying to come up in the world. I think it's only going to be a distraction. You're spending money, getting drugged up, escaping reality, especially smoking weed. It makes you lethargic. It's a it's an unnecessary handicap. And for all you weirdos out there, oh my God, but Joe Rogan smokes, Elon Musk smoke. Elon Musk does not smoke all the time. Matter of fact, when he smoked with Joe Rogan, he ended up getting in trouble for that. They started drug testing him all over the place because he has federally funding. Joe Rogan, I guarantee you, as he was building up his empire, probably more than likely was not a pothead. And if he was, congratulations. That's an exception to the rule. But most people that are high performers, all the millionaires that I know, including myself, none of us smoke fucking weed, okay? None of us. All the high performers I know, they don't go ahead and introduce some kind of chemical agent that's going to, you know, uh, handicap them to becoming better versions of themselves. People that are winners just don't do that shit. Why are you, life's already hard. Earning money is already hard. Why the fuck are you going to do that? Jason Capital famously came on the podcast and told me, yeah, dude, I stopped smoking weed. I want to become a higher performer. I stopped that shit. So everyone I know that's super successful guys, they don't do that shit. All right? You shouldn't either. Success leaves clues, baby. Author Donald Freed believes it may shed light on Simpson's presence at the crime scene and his strange behavior. I think this is a drugs murder. I think Mr. Simpson knows basically who did it. I think his guilt is based not on what he did, but on what he did not do. I believe he feels he may have left his children as hostages to fortune. He says that he will never forgive himself for not having followed the advice of a friend of Miss Brown's who had said, get your ex-wife and your children out of here. There was something wrong. I think he hints broadly uh, at the context of the murder. What he does not say and what keeps him from ever clearing his name, perhaps, is that to really clear his name, he would have to speak of what he knew. And that involves drugs and all sorts of things that perhaps are more painful uh, almost than being wrongfully accused of murder. Yeah, he's on to something here. And from this murky world of drugs, there was a major lead which even the police wanted to investigate further. But the district attorney's office dismissed it as pure fabrication. Just five weeks after the murders, a story surfaced which showed that Nicole was being stalked by someone else. Police in Newport Beach, just south of Los Angeles, sent out a press release. It stated that they had convicted a man who had stolen the car of Simpson's then-girlfriend, Paula Barbieri. When oh, what the hell? Shit's about to get weird. When they arrested the man, named Bill Waz, they also discovered that he had a notebook detailing surveillance on Nicole. But it, wait, there's more. So if Nicole was being stalked, could this be part of a conspiracy that led to her murder? And we know that's fairly accurate because uh, Nicole was in fantastic shape when she was murdered. She would have lived a very long life had she not been brutally murdered. She worked out at, um, um, a lot. She ran every morning. She was in the gym. She took great care of herself. Again, guys, she lived, a, you know, the single mom life. Uh, she was getting paid. You know, in today's day and age, uh, today's dollars, a uh, quarter million dollars a year almost, right? She was making 10K a month back in 1992, which is equivalent about 21K today per month. And on top of that, she got uh, $500,000 uh, up front from OJ, which is a million dollars today. So effectively, this woman became a millionaire and she was getting paid a significant amount of child support per month. So she was set, man. You know, she was living life. Whoa, this is interesting. I mean, I can remember the, the thrill, the, the adrenaline was rushing through the entire press corps that day when all of a sudden it came out. Somebody was stalking Nicole Brown Simpson in December and he's in jail with a diary and 
One of the reasons he's in jail is for stealing Paula Barbieri's truck. Whoa, a lot of coincidences here. A lot of interest. CNN raced to get the news story. Why did they hire you to follow Nicole? They wanted to know who she was seeing, who she was meeting. Who hired you? Could you tell me? You don't want to tell me? I can't tell you that. That's, that's pushing it. You know, I have my life too, you know. It's not much, but it's all I got. Yeet! The Los Angeles police can't tell nobody. took this story seriously too. They sent one of their most experienced murder detectives on the case to Calipatria prison to check it out. We flew down there and went in and talked to Mr. Waz. My objective with Mr. Waz was twofold. One, obviously, to get a handwriting exemplar that would certainly uh, lock it down that he was, in fact, the one that wrote that those entries, which he never denied. And the other was is to find out what was going on. So you have the LAPD, you know, doing good police work, you know, following up on a viable lead of a guy that potentially was stalking Nicole. But, you know, the district attorney's office was like, no, we don't want this. It's not sexy enough. No, we know OJ did it, man. And I think that's kind of one of the faults of the uh, of the prosecution of OJ is that they didn't look at all the other factors. They were so goddamn dead set on going after OJ because it was a sexier case. Let's be honest. You know, you got a famed football, former football star, actor, um, you know, uh, a loved hero in the United States, you know, record holder, high, former Heisman trophy holder, you know, and you can go ahead and prosecute him. Why the hell are you going to sit there and go after some dork at a jail or his bum ass son, who's like a failed chef that, you know, can't even beat take out Chinese for his girlfriend. Like, why are you going to pursue these leads? No, it was OJ. He was the sole perpetrator, you know? Uh, but, you know, as you guys can see here, we're 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 definitely picking up some some steam here and some other potential situations that could have occurred. Bill Waz was also a cocaine dealer. He'd been introduced to Simpson and a close friend by one of the staff in the Roxbury nightclub. So he was selling drugs to Nicole as well. Uh, he hooked me up with some people that wanted to buy some some cocaine, and uh, then OJ came strolling over. And he introduced himself as well. Still in prison, Waz agreed to be interviewed by telephone for this film. We exchanged numbers, and they said we'd be doing business in the future, and they, we, we did that from there, yes. I mean, they, they weren't habitual users. They were recreational users, maybe twice a week. Waz said he delivered cocaine to Simpson and Nicole at the home on Rockingham Avenue. But more importantly, Waz also says he supplied Simpson's friend. It was this same friend who then asked him to follow Nicole and to take pictures of her with any man she met. No private eye, Bill Waz thought that it would be easy money. They asked me if I would uh, do a little surveillance on OJ's wife, see if she was cheating on him with uh, any individual. But she was at that time staying at the Rockingham address. I picked her up there. I followed her around for about a day and a half. And uh, I took some pictures at Tony Roma's off Ventura Boulevard of her kissing a black individual, a man who I later learned was uh, Marcus Allen. Oh shit. oh, shit. Oh, shit. A former friend of O.J. Simpson. Nicole's affair with American football star Marcus Allen had already caused friction. Armed with the rolls of film, Waz met Simpson's friend, who can't be named. Here is Marcus Allen right here, guys. Okay. Um, Marcus Lamar Allen is a former American football running back, analyst, and actor who played in the National Football League for 16 seasons, primarily with the Los Angeles Raiders. Okay. And uh, here he is, man. This is a former friend of OJ's. Um, and yeah, he was rumored to have uh, been sleeping with Nicole Simpson. Um, you know, he he still to this day denies hooking up with her. Um, but OJ is 100% certain. And I think a big reason why he's probably 100% certain is because this guy was probably conducting surveillance for him, you know, and rumors fly in LA. And Nicole was single, you know, so she was out here, you know, as the girls would say, single as a Pringle. So what's she going to do? She's going to. Hypergamy never ends, guys, okay? No matter how much money a girl has, hypergamy doesn't end. And this guy, obviously, uh, Nicole has a type. This guy's an athlete, same build, same look as OJ. Eh, whatever, right? Named for legal reasons. Successful guy. So I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, they, that he, why he's so sure that he, he slept with her. 
in the parking lot of McDonald's on Ventura Boulevard. I believe I turned over the film and got the cash to him at the parking lot in Encino, McDonald's. And 10 days after that, he invited me over to his house. Remarkably, the friend then asked Waz to steal Simpson's girlfriend's four-wheel drive car. Waz was told when and where to take it, even where the keys would be. Bam. Uh, and then also, just so you guys know, right? Um, oh, shit. Oh, that's a, here's another thing that I forgot to mention as well. So, um, Nicole Simpson had a diary, guys. And she kept this diary because she wanted to document all the times that OJ had um, attacked her. Okay? And this diary was never used by the prosecution um, because it would, been, it would have been hearsay. Okay, confirmed. Nicole Brown Simpson did have an affair with OJ's best friend, Marcus Allen, and detailed it in her diary. And Simpson threatened to kill his wife if she saw him again one month before her death. Nicole Brown confirms in diary entries shown during the new documentary, OJ Made, and Made in America, that she had an affair with Marcus Allen. According to his former agent, Mike Gilbert, OJ Simpson told Nicole one month before her murder, you ever see Marcus again and I will kill you. And as you guys can see here, here is OJ with uh, Marcus Allen, right? Here they are, some photographs together, right? This old photo of them being friends when they were used to be friends, right? And her, here he is right here. I don't know if this is Nicole here. Okay. Care, Care says the Marcus thing ab about me. OJ says it is. I want to shrug it off. He says I'm terrible for it. I wasn't married. Should have thought of... Catherine, man, I I think that's her handwriting. It's really tough to read, but um, yeah, that comes from her, from her diary, guys. Um, so Marcus also denied the affair under oath while giving a deposition in Simpson's 1996 civil trial. <laughs> so he lied under oath. Uh, Catherine appeared to be appeared on the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills last season and denied the affair between her ex and Nicole. Okay. Marcus is engaged and later married to his first wife, Catherine, around this time. And Nicole writes that she shouldn't have thought about her. Okay, there we go. That's that's where Catherine comes from. Um, and here we go. She writes in a di diary that she feels beautiful and sexy and smart when she is with Marcus and that he makes her feel special. So he basically did what OJ didn't, right? Um, okay, bam. And that's I think that's her right there with him. Nicole Brown confirms the diary entries shown during the new documentary, OJ Made in America, that she had a feral Marcus. And then OJ Simpson considered Marcus to be a protege, Simpson Allen, above in 1986. And, uh, yeah. See, man, this is why y'all gotta, you gotta be able to get over women quickly, man. And this is his wife, Catherine, in 1992. Him and OJ have the same goddamn taste in women, huh? And then here's her diary. Nicole writes in uh, one diary entry that feels beautiful and sexy, smart when she was with Marcus, as opposed to feeling jabs when she's with Simpson. Bam. There you go, man. Here's her diary that they never put into uh, evidence for the prosecution. And like I said before, because it's hearsay, she wasn't alive to testify to it. But a law actually came out after the OJ trial, guys, that allowed... Um, for diaries to be used in cases like this of domestic violence. Okay. So that actually sets some uh, legal precedent as well. So, okay, let's uh, go back here to the, to the documentary. Shortly after stealing the car, Waz was arrested. Hey guys, do me a favor. Please like the video because I did a lot of research for this video. As you guys can see, I'm bringing stuff off the top of my head from all the research that I did. This stuff takes a lot of time. Um, and honestly, I do it for y'all. This channel isn't really made to make money. It's made to, you know, grow the channel, hit, hit 100K, get a plaque, flex on some haters. You know, I do this out of enjoyment because I really do enjoy breaking these cases down. Right now, as a matter of fact, it's 7.56 in the morning. I still haven't slept. <laughs> and we've been going now for about two and a half hours, man. So, but I do it for the love of the game, guys. Do me a favor. Just like the video. I did a broadcast earlier. Check that out with the Trump... Uh, a search warrant breakdown with my boy legal mindset, AKA Andrew Esquire. And, uh, you know, we just keep on steaming along, baby. Arrested and jailed for 20 years.
for a series of armed robberies. But clearly, he knew more about the operation. After getting the basic details, Detective Bert Looper wanted to know who'd hired him. I asked him, well, you know, who are these people? Are they friends of OJ or, you know, well, they're close to OJ. And then he starts asking me some questions. Was asked Detective Looper how much he knew about this particular friend of Simpson's. Well, maybe you should look into his background. Uh, maybe you should be looking into his friends. Well, if you're listening to what he's telling you, then the connection back to OJ is there. All right, so why would OJ... That guy has an epic mustache, by the way. They want to follow Nicole, and why would OJ's friend hire this dope-dealing drug addict uh, to do it? So with this information, I go back to the police department and I said, look, Tom, this guy's righteous. He's telling me the truth. He admits to writing this stuff. We got the handwriting exemplar and it solidifies that. This was way before the murder occurred. I think that this guy can lead us to uh, a contract killing and we can go after more than one person here. And I don't remember if it was Phil or Tom who said, hey, they're not going to follow it up. Forget it. That's coming from the DA's office. That isn't coming from two investigators who know that this is a good clue or a good direction to follow. For the prosecution, Waz's story didn't fit with the notion of Simpson as the jealous husband and lone killer. Just two months after the murders and before the court case had even begun, the investigation was dropped. Bam. <laughs> Not sexy enough, guys. I told you before, man. A lot of these, um, you know, prosecutorial offices, the clout chasers, man. Hey, what's the better? Uh, uh, you know, and that's a big fuck up on the state. You know, this is they shouldn't have done that. You know, but they were they had a hard on for OJ. While we're all running around trying to get some answers to this, we're told by both sides. Ah, another one of those cranks. Guys, don't worry about it. That notebook was made up in prison. It's a forgery. It's a fake. Forget about it. Go on. So. And I'm ashamed to say I was one of the press, I was one of the people at the middle of the press corps at that time. And because we had so many things like coming like coming and going like that, I'm embarrassed to say I believe them since both sides put it out so categorically. And it made sense. Another criminal trying to make money off of the O.J. Simpson case. But four years later, Joe Bosco discovered that the Waz notebook was not a forgery as he had been told. Oh. He then tracked Waz down to interview him. Still in prison, Waz told him the full story. Here we go. Waz explained that 10 days after handing over the photographs, he had been asked by Simpson's same friend to a meeting for a new assignment. It was ventilating rage and how, how much she caused OJ, how she, she talked too much about the business venture, her sleeping with uh, a lot of his friends. It would be safe to say that she kind of uh, pushed the envelope a little bit there. So. But tonight, he also reveals that Simpson's friend then hired him as a hitman to kill Nicole. They should made the proposition. Asked him wanted me to uh, take a certain gun, which he had, which I did not take. Asked if I would do her for, you know, get rid of her for 15 grand. And I semi accept the responsibility of a good deed. 15K. But was suspected that if he killed Nicole, he would be set up as the fall guy. I believe that they'd have had me done the deed, either A, frame me for it, or B, kill me on the spot and place me as kind of psycho stalker of OJ's women or something. Just so you guys know, 15000 in 1994 is equivalent in the purchasing power to about $29,987 as of today. So he would have gotten paid about thirty k to do this hit in today's dollars. Who knows? But Damn inflation is a bitch, isn't it? I already saw that coming, sort of, so I, that's why I never even intended to uh, do the deed. Bosco then approached Bill Hodgman, the director of special operations in the district attorney's office, who had worked on the case. And I said, Bill, you remember the Waz story? Is it worth following up on? Is it, is it worth my time? And Bill Hodgman said something I'll never forget. He said, Joseph, if they gave me a paid leave of absence, I would do nothing but work the Waz angle. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. That's oh, shit. where this crime 
would have been and can be broken. Bosco then brought in a former senior prosecutor to act as Waz's lawyer, who needed to be convinced of his client's story. I wanted to really get inside of his mind. He's a very awesome, intimidating individual. And I wanted to look him in the eye, so to speak, and see what's in it for you. See, if there was and this is very important. When you deal with criminals, you got to go ahead and figure out what the hell is this guy's motive here. OK, and I think this is very important breakdown here of figuring out what the fuck was this guy's intention. Um, and you guys are going to see there's a high likelihood it was he was honest to some degree here. Let's break it down was something in it for him, then maybe I'd have had a different read on it. But when a guy gives you this kind of evidence, lays himself out, uh, is threatened. See, now he's going to be known as a snitch, right? Snitch is not what you want to be in Calipatria. And uh, he was on level four, which is with the bad of the baddest, okay? Uh, those were the highest killers in prison. That's where he was stationed. So you want you don't want to be laying yourself out unless you get something. And I, he, he wanted nothing. I said, well, what do you want to do this for? It was almost like, I hate to say it, he was an honorable crook. Bill Hodgman in the district attorney's office was impressed by the evidence backing up Waz's story. He asked Bert Looper, the detective who had investigated the case first time round, to work with Bosco. They began to look into Simpson's friend. As you guys can see, there was no benefit to him doing this shit. If anything, it's just a liability. He ain't getting paid or nothing like that. He's in prison. Looper and Bosco discovered that the friend had connections to other illegal activities. They found that Nicole may have become indiscreet about these criminal enterprises and that she might have been killed to keep her quiet. But a new LAPD investigation of the Simpson case was not a popular move. It was shut down. And you're going to see why here for a second. When you get into embarrassing the department or hurting or tarnishing the image of the Los Angeles Police Department, as the O.J. Simpson did case did do. And they would. This is remember, guys, this is four years later, them doing the wise investigation. OK, this is four years after the fact. It it embarrassed the investigative branch of the Los Angeles Police Department. Bottom line. Facts. They don't want that again. Facts. Right? Because now they got to deal with the same issues again. They just don't want to know. They don't want to know what really happened. I mean, that's the best way I can put it. That was a black eye on not only the law, the, you know, the Los Angeles Police Department. It was also a black eye on the prosecutor's office, the, the, the you know, the, um, the assistant district attorney's office. So it's a L all around. So they're like, we already lost the trial. We lost our prime suspect. Even if we were able to find evidence that links OJ Simpson to this murder, we can't try him again under double jeopardy. So this is a loss for us. Why are we going to go ahead and do this? We're not going to fuck that. This is a black eye. We're going to just leave this, you know, leave this thing in the grave. You know, we don't, we're not going to, you know, revitalize this, this black eye for us. I would have loved to have heard, you know, about Waz when it happened. I would have loved to have seen what was the reason why you guys don't want to follow his lead. Can't hurt you. In my view, that investigation should have proceeded onward. If you go after these people and you have a solid case and you're working with a solid foundation and you're and you're doing the right things who cares if you get embarrassed i mean you know is your job the truth or is it your image facts but for them it's going to be the image man this was a huge case and they lost on one of the biggest stages of all time so they're definitely going to give that a big nope we're good we don't want to do that the district attorney's office refused to take part in this film they closed down the was investigation twice despite evidence of a plot against Nicole. Nope. Exactly. They failed to investigate Jason Simpson's alibi. They failed to compare Jason's fingerprints with the nine unidentified prints found at the murder scene. Oh, shit. Hmm. And in a last and... Nine unidentified fingerprints at the crime scene. Final twist. They have also failed to follow up a forgotten clue from Ron Goldman's shirt which one of the original trial consultants believes could shed light on the killer. There's two patterns that are very significant and quite remarkable on the back of his shirt. 
and those are grab patterns, bloody grab patterns, meaning that the hand of someone else, not himself, because and this is from the prosecution, by the way, would be impossible that have grabbed and twisted the back of his shirt in the mid back and on the upper left shoulder. Using new scientific techniques, Rod Englert believes that these grab patterns could still identify the killer once and for all. In the last two years, there has been a process of getting fingerprints off of cloth with blood as the medium. And yes, this shirt has the possibility of now, even today, even though it's been handled, but I don't think it'll ever be done. This case is closed. New evidence. Nobody but, wants to talk about this anymore. Yep. A lot of things have happened. There's a lot of water under the bridge. And the jury has already spoken. And most importantly, they can't get their star suspect in jail anymore, O.J. Simpson, because of double jeopardy. So the prosecution's office is looking at it like, bro, fuck this. We're good. We're not going to deal with this anymore. We're just going to go ahead and take the L and move on. Turn into Goku in this bitch and get out of here and focus on gangs and some other stuff in L.A. It's on. Is it possible that the case could be reopened? It's clear from the new leads revealed tonight that a new investigation may be able to solve the crime. With accusations of corruption within the Los Angeles police forcing the reopening of hundreds of other cases, the truth about the deaths of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman could still be told. Bam. All right. Now, guys, we're going to go ahead and break down a portion uh, from O.J. Simpson actually speaking. Actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and take a, a trip down um, memory lane here. Hey, guys, welcome back to a new video. Today, we're in Brentwood, California, at the site of the O.J. Simpson murders. As now, you guys if you can believe see, that O.J. did it, this yeah. is where it happened. If you don't believe that, nobody knows for sure. Now, this garage door on the left was Nicole Brown Simpson's, and the gate right next to it is where supposedly O.J. went through and uh, killed both Nicole and Ron Goldman at the far end up by, up by the front of Bundy Drive. Now, this is 875 Bundy Drive, or it was when the murders happened, but now it's 879 Bundy Drive just to kind of keep people from coming and visiting this location. Because uh, there was a bunch of people going back and forth trying to check that place out. Now let's go to the second. Uh, actually, hold on. He's going to go to the front of the house now. Now, O.J. Simpson and Nicole had a pretty rocky relationship towards the end. But they were both active in their kids' lives. But up here, just around the corner, is the right-hand side. It's the first one here closest so to the So they completely road. changed it. But this is not the original doorway. The original doorway was just to the right of this. And I'll show you that in a couple. So this is a lot of people mistake that as being the original. This is the original building, but you're going to see here in a second. Right here. So now, this, this is the original walkway and Nicole was found just on the other side of this mesh fence here. Now, this whole walkway was torn up and taken out. And the new walkway, as you saw, was to the left of this now. But this was the walkway that was here. I don't think any of it is still original, although the stairs right there could be. But this is this was the crime scene right here. Now, if you notice on the very left side of the photo, the palm tree that the uh, crime scene ribbon tape is tied to is just to the left of the walkway here. That tree is still there. This is today. And that's the same tree. So that puts, there you go. You can use that same reference and this hole right here as well. Puts the walkway just to the right of that tree where there is no walkway anymore. And this little slab. Now, in this picture, if you look to the bottom of the screen just in front of the police car, the some it's still right here. Bam. Same so slab. So as you see from these pictures, the original crime location, the walkway, was just to the right of this palm tree. And just to the left of the drain down here. Bam. Original so it's photo. obviously not in the same location. A lot of people seem to think that it's still um, the current walkway that's in there if you walk by. But it's it's been torn up for a while now. Now this is what it looks like now. It's just to the left of this uh, white door here. So you really can't see anything at all from where it actually was. Yeah. At least not from it. the outside. 
Now here's a mezzaluna. Now here's the other part of this. The last place that Nicole Simpson was before she went home was Mezzaluna Restaurant. This used to be Mezzaluna Restaurant, and obviously it is no more because this is L.A. and everything gets torn down or goes out at some point. But this is where she had her last meal. She dropped her glasses inside. Her friend Ron Goldman was a waiter here. He picked up the glasses and brought them back to Nicole's apartment after his shift ended. And had had she not uh, lost her glasses here, maybe Ron Goldman still would be alive today. We don't know. But this was the old site of the Mezzaluna restaurant, which was walking distance to Nicole's condo. Now for the final part. Yeah, and this is where Ron Goldman lived, which was right very close to her. Um, okay, so now that we got an idea, now this is going to make more sense, guys, from O.J. Simpson. He's going to talk about, uh, he's going to actually talk about the murder here. And this is an interview he did back from 2006. First and only time he ever talked about the murders to promote his book, If I Did It, which is hilarious, um, where he actually talks about a hypothetical and where he, you know, if he actually did it, how it would have went, which is actually very telling. I consider this more of a confession and it answers some, you know, longstanding questions as to how this guy actually pulled this shit off. So uh, let's get into it, man. From his own mouth. Pause. O.J. Simpson never took the stand at his criminal trial. And well, for obvious reasons. I mean, that would be stupid. No defense attorney, especially the dream team that he had, would be dumb enough to put their client on the stand and has never given an interview about his actions on the night of the murders. That is until now. Listen closely for the next six uninterrupted minutes. Here we go. OJ puts himself hypothetically at the scene of the crime. Um, the chapter, chapter six is called the night in question. Mm -hmm. uh, and you write in the book. Now picture this and keep in mind that this is Purely hypothetical, hypothetical, hypothetical. Yes. Why don't you tell me what might have happened on the night of June 12th, 1994? <laughs> and let's just walk yeah, through the night. I, well, first of all, it's, this is very difficult for me to do this. Uh, it was very difficult for me because it's hypothetical. I know and I accept the fact that people are going to feel whatever way they're going to feel. <laughs> you know, uh, they're going to, uh, um, you know, some uh, whatever, uh, whatever they want to feel. In the book, the hypothetical is... Uh, Charlie, uh, uh, that Charlie. Uh, this guy Charlie shows up, the guy who I recently become friends with, and uh, I don't know why you had been by Nicole's house, but it told me you wouldn't believe what's going on over there. And uh, and I remember thinking, well, whatever's going on over there has got to stop, right? So we kind of hooked up together, and uh, you know, I'm kind of broad stroking this. We go over. Get into Bronco and go over it. Let's just go back and do the details. Where did you I'm park? Let's do the detail. You park in, in the, the hypothetical, go in the alley. Right. You park in the alley. Yeah. And you put on a wool cap and gloves. Uh, in the hypothetical, I put on a cap and gloves. Right. Yeah. And um, you reach. Which is a little off because we know that his hairs did not match what was in the, the cap. We'll continue under the seat for um, a knife. I always kept a knife in the car for the crazies and stuff because you can't travel with a gun. And I remember Charlie saying, you ain't bringing that. Knife. Gotta love LA, huh? I didn't, right? But I believe he took it. Charlie took the knife? Yeah. In the book. Yeah. Yes. So the back gate, you go through the back gate? Yes. And it was open or broken or... I don't recall. Okay. I go in the back gate, guys, is what I showed y'all earlier in the other video right here. Okay. This is the back gate right here, guys, where he entered in. All right. And get this out the way. Go to the front, and I'm looking to see what's going on. Um, and I can see that it appears like Nicole had, flop, I had candles all the time. She really did to keep her overhead down, I think. And music was on. And uh, while I was there, a guy shows up. 
You know, so Ron Goldman comes in the back gate. Yeah, a, a, a guy I really didn't recognize. I, I may have seen him around, but I really didn't recognize him to be anyone. And uh, and I, in the mood I was in, I started having words with him. He says to you, I just came by to return a pair of glasses. Judy left them at the restaurant. Yeah, words to that effect, yes. And, and Judy is Nicole's mother. And, uh, he was I don't on... know if I believe it or didn't believe it. Uh, it was pretty much immaterial because, you know, uh, I was more concerned about everything that, that everything that was going on, you know, and uh, was you know, fed up with it, I guess. And uh, You get into a fight. Nicole comes out. And a verbal. A verbal, a verbal fight. fight. Got a little loud. And by that time, uh, uh, Nicole had come out. And we started having words about who is this guy? Why is he here? What's going on? And, and she says, this is my house. Get that the F out yeah, of here. Yes. And uh, which I didn't like because, once again, this is the same person. And if you read the book, you'll see some things that happened in the two weeks leading up to this that were uh, very, very irritating. And just so you guys know, just to put you, give you guys full perspective on what's going on here, at the recital, okay, prior to the recital, a lot of people don't know this, more inside information for y'all, so please like the goddamn video because a lot of people aren't going to talk about this, all right? OJ, um, prior to, on the day of the murder, OJ was golfing with friends and, um, and uh, Nicole was getting, you know, some flowers and getting some stuff right for the recital for their daughter. Right. And prior to the recital, OJ and uh, Nicole had an explosive argument on the phone. OK. And in this argument, OJ had told her that he was going to report her to the IRS for undeclared um, money that she had earned through the divorce and everything else. You know, it was obviously a messy divorce. He had given her a substantial amount of money, as I described to you guys earlier, about a million dollars in today's day, in, in today's dollars uh, to include uh, $20,000 a month, okay? That was back in 1992 when they originally divorced. It was about, it was $10,000 a month along with a $500,000 upfront settlement, okay? So he was threatening to report it to the IRS. This obviously got her hot. She's an unemployed woman doesn't really have any means of income, doesn't have any skills, okay? Remember, she married OJ when she was 18 and was 100% dependent upon him. So they had a very, very, uh, uh, you know, toxic argument about this on the phone. So when they show up to the recital and see each other, he sees the way she's dressed. He doesn't like that. It pisses him off, instigates a little bit more anger. So there was, uh, on this day, guys, there was some arguments, right? And this isn't really commonly talked about. You know, uh, and I think Charlie had followed this guy in, one make sure it was no problem, and he brought the knife. As things got heated, uh, I just remember Nicole fell and hurt herself. And uh, you mean Charlie hit her upside the head a couple of times, it's extremely hard. And, uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing, and I. And we're going to talk about who we think Charlie is here soon. Well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed... Kara he gets into a karate thing. Okay. Self-defense, obviously. The knife. I do remember that portion, taking the knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there and there's all kind of stuff around. And um, I don't remember. There's all kind of stuff around. This guy. Stupid. <sighs> um, what kind of stuff? But and stuff around. You know, we... You know, I hate to say this, but this is like, but I'm right, sorry. Right. I know we got to back up again. Right. It's <laughs> you know? okay. I want to back this up. This is hard. This is this hard. Is hard. To, I know. Yeah. I want to back it's up. Too. Look at how he's like laughing about the situation. Crazy, bro. Crazy, crazy, craziness, man. Got to make people think that I'm a I know. I know. <laughs> um, you wrote in the book, I had never seen so much blood in my life. Covered. You're covered. The scene. Can you describe yeah, it? I, I, it's hard for me to describe it, I'm telling you. I don't think any two people could be um, heard it the way they were without everybody been covered in blood. And of course, I think we've all seen the grisly pictures after. So yeah, I think everything was covered, would have been covered in mm -hmm. blood. And what goes through your mind at a time like that? I don't know. It's like, what happened? You write about 
removing a glove before taking the knife from Charlie? Uh, you know, I had no conscious memory of doing that, but obviously I must have because they found a glove there. And blacking out. Have you ever blacked out before? Not to my knowledge. No. No. Of course, you... uh, of course, if something like this would take place in anybody's life, if it were to happen, I would imagine it's something that you would probably automatically uh, have trouble wrapping your, your mind around it. It was horrible. It was absolutely hard. Crazy, crazy, crazy. <laughs> Here's the interviewer. Here's the pro one of the prosecutors, Chris Darden, that was involved in it. And this is an FBI profiler right here um, on body language and uh, criminal mindset. First thoughts. Eve, it's hard. Oh, and this is uh, one of Nicole's friends. For you to even breathe. I've been watching you as you watch this. I have nothing to say about this. Absolutely nothing. Chris. Well, I think he's confessed to murder. I think he's confessed to murder. And, uh, If I had known he said this in 2006, I would not have objected to the release of this video. Yeah, so this video didn't get released, guys, until years later. Um, and, uh, you know, because obviously they objected to it. They didn't want him to profit off of the death of Nicole. So it was never actually released, and this is the first time. So this is um, several years later after the fact. I don't think that there's any question of his involvement and, um, and that he is the person who is wielding the knife. I mean, he may try and describe it as a hypothetical, but of course it becomes I, I did this, I felt this, I saw this. Um, and they can't prosecute him. Double jeopardy United States, my friends. Once you're acquitted of a crime, can't come back after you for the same crime. This notion of Charlie... I think Charlie is OJ. This is no hypothetical. Mm -hmm. This is reality. Judith, who the heck is Charlie? I don't know who Charlie is. I wanted... No, she aged fantastically. The wall takes no prisoners, guys. <laughs> to talk. For me to start interrogating him and pushing him, I felt he would get more agitated and he kept threatening to leave and not to finish the interview. And I really wanted him to stay. And that was a good move on her part. Let's listen again to this disturbing portion of the interview. I remember I grabbed a knife. I do remember that portion, taking a knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there and it's all kind of stuff around and um um what kind of stuff but and stuff around you know we you know. i think and eve i'm sorry but i i do want to go through what the coroner says happened because i think it's important to understand the specific details it was not as he describes exactly yeah, he's admitting a lot of details here, but I, there's a reason why he did this, guys, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, also, real quick, I think this is a very important moment in the trial, speaking of gloves. Um, and this, again, leads going to lead to my theory uh, that I'm going to bring you guys, but it's very obvious that OJ did not do this by himself. He even admits it. Uh, as you guys can see, this is the famous glove test that Christopher Darden himself, this prosecutor right here, probably one of the biggest mistakes he ever made in his prosecutorial career, allowing OJ Simpson to test the gloves on. And Shapiro was very smart because Shapiro had put his hands in it and knew that his hands couldn't fit in it and, or barely fit in it. And his hands were a lot smaller than OJ's. And on top of that, OJ also suffers from arthritis guys, which makes his hands swell up um, every now and then. So he knew that OJ's hands would have fit in it. And obviously from a jury standpoint, this is, you know, huge for them to see, oh, their murderer's gloves allegedly don't fit 
on top of r- racist cops and blood issues with the DNA and all this other stuff. And these cops are racist in LA and half the jury over half the jury is black women. Of course, they're going to go ahead and acquit, man. And then, of course, that's what led to Johnny Cochran's famous quote. If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. There's Darden right there, a much skinnier Darden. Can't get him on. This is uh, People's 164A. Is that the right hand glove? Yeah. All right. And this is a legendary moment here, guys, in court TV. And here we go. And his defense team was very smart planning this, Shapiro and Johnny Cochran, and they tell him, watch this, what he does. After he clearly, he's, you know, struggles in there. Oh, I'm trying. Oh, can't get it on. Oh, can't do it. Can't do it, guys. It don't fit. Our Look. Director should collect that Mr. Simpson has both gloves. Can't get them on. Yes. Right, and then bam. He holds the hand, the, the glove. This is this is a you know historic moment right here, guys, in American criminal justice system. He holds his hands up with the gloves to the jury. Look, guys, they don't fit. I'm not the killer. All right. Thank you, counsel. Bam. Johnny Cochran is just like, gotcha, bitch. and then you can see Shapiro right there in the corner. He was the one that came up with this idea. And he's just like, we got him. All right, so let's go ahead. Thought I'd give you all that little bonus because that was an iconic moment of the of the trial, of course. Okay, so now that we know the hypothetical, let's go ahead and get into what the hell actually happened between 10, 15 p.m. till midnight when the police finally found Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman on June 12th, 1994 in Los Angeles, Brentwood neighborhood. Okay. This video right here, guys, is pretty damn good. Now I'm going to go ahead and give my theory on this shit, which I agree with a lot of this video. And then uh, we'll go ahead and break it down. But my theory is this. We know, right? Or actually, you know what? Hmm. Audible. I'll go ahead and play the video for y'all and then I'll give my theory at the end. Let's play this video. Because I agree with some portions of it and disagree with some others. But this is this one pr- brings some pretty damn good information. You have your discretion advised, guys. Case number BA097211. We, the jury, and the above entitled Oh, FYI, this trial took 10 months, by the way, guys. It ended in October, but it started in, like, January. All right? Crazy. Defendant Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. I forget exactly when it started. It started early. You know, I'll look it up real quick. I always loved it when they said there's a mountain of evidence, trails of blood. Okay, Simpson was formally arranged July 22nd, 1994, entering a plea not guilty. The trial began on January 24th, 1995, okay? And it went all the way till October 5th. Crazy. Longest trial in L.A. history. Well, there was no amount of evidence in my mind. They thought we got our guy. Okay, I'm not going to go as far as say O.J. is innocent, but let's keep going. This does make some compelling arguments, but OJ definitely ain't innocent.
And they know this from the phone tolls, guys, that she had contacted the restaurant. Pablo Pinjuvi's a neighbor of Nicole Brown Simpson is watching TV. Crazy stuff. He looks outside and hears the constant barking of Nicole's dog. 11, 11, 15 p.m. OJ puts his bags into his limousine and leaves for the airport. And we know that the limousine driver saw OJ right around 10.55 p.m. OJ leaves on a flight to Chicago where people reportedly saw a cut on his arm. Saw no cut on his arm. Okay. OJ Simpson does not have time to slaughter his wife, be surprised by a guy half his age, stab that guy a bunch of times by himself, and get away with everything. Get rid of the weapons and the bloody clothing and whatever else had blood on it. If he did do this, he would have had blood in his eyelashes, for God's sakes. He'd had a blood covered in blood and you can't be cool calm and collected getting a, in a limo 20 minutes after the murder I, i'll give the government the best i think it's 31 minutes also he had a bag with him that he, he did not want his limousine driver to touch guys that probably had all the clothes they never found the blood-stained clothing all right from the murder to the time he's in the limo i don't think it would be solved but people have said well who did it i said well i worked 18 hours a day for I don't know, 17 months on this case. And forget about since then, all the times I've thought about it. I don't know who did it, but I know who didn't do it. OJ Simpson did not murder two people. That's why I, that's why I disagree. Well, let's continue. The real killer. Oh, who's that, guys? Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Jason Simpson. OJ's son from a prior marriage. Some sinister music. So after the divorce, he was expecting her to go back to his mom. But when he learned that OJ was actually trying to rebuild his relationship with Nicole, it started to upset him. Yeah, mind you guys, they divorced in like 92, but they were working things out. They were still sleeping with each other. They're still seeing each other. So um, Nicole had even like tried to, you know, you know, hey, I want to be together again with the kids or whatever. But they were seeing each other occasionally, which is why OJ went to her house that night and started fucking some guy. Jason was diagnosed with intermittent rage disorder. We know this. He nearly killed an ex-girlfriend with a butcher knife. We know this. He almost seriously injured another girl, and he also attacked a former boss with a knife. So we know that this guy has issues. Serious issues. And he's an alcoholic and drug addict. Nicole was, hold on, what did I say? Nicole was supposed to arrive to Jason's restaurant on that night. Yes, as you guys know, she had bookings for that restaurant. Jason wanted to speak to Nicole, but she canceled at the very last minute, which would have been enough to anger Jason in the mental condition he was in. Not to mention his dad was already pissed off at her as well. They had a heated argument about the IRS, which I told you guys before. Jason contacted OJ and told him how uh, upset he was with Nicole. Jason was already gone when OJ arrived to the restaurant. OJ decided to head to Nicole's instead. By the time OJ got to Nicole's, it was already too late. Nicole walked to her front gate, unaware that she was about to be attacked. Jason stabbed Nicole. And Rob Goldman multiple times. All that OJ could do when he got there was yank the knife away from him.
According to one of Jason's ex-classmates, Jason was trained in hand-to-hand combat as well as knife training while attending the Army and Navy Academy. And he was a chef, had a bunch of knives. The bottom end of Jason's knife found by a private investigator, William C. Deere, matches the size of the wound on the back of Nicole's head. And I'll try to find you guys this picture here in a second. The bottom end of Jason's knife found by a private investigator uh, matched the size of the wound at the back of Nicole's head. It was found at the very bottom of a storage locker owned by Jason. OJ helped Jason get out of there as soon as possible. Jason was completely covered in blood. All of that blood could have very easily been stained on OJ. Yes, absolutely. Very true. Um, I'm going to try to find here, guys, the hit on her head. So here's one. This is the wound on the back of her head, guys, that they're talking about here. Okay. Oh, my God. Is it not? Okay. Hold on, guys. Give me one second. Let me pull it from, from Google for y'all real fast. Um, this is it right here. Okay. As y'all can see, this is the wound. All right. Which matches his knife size. Which explains the blood stain found at OJ's Bronco. And remember, guys, the blood in the Bronco was awkwardly placed in a center console, which is more indicative of a passenger sitting on the other side getting the blood in that weird place. This is why OJ was more concerned about asking who did it when the police contacted him the next day. He was worried for Jason. OJ immediately hired top criminal attorney Carl Jones to represent Jason, even though he wasn't a suspect. Oh, a lot of people don't know that, do they? And then not only that, that's a big reason why OJ went and cooperated with the police to see what they knew. Crime experts believe that Jason should have been a major suspect in the investigation. The murder took place between 9.45 to 10.05. Nobody knows about Jason's whereabouts after 9.50 that night. I would say the murders probably took place anywhere between, you know, later. It could have been from 9.45 all the way to, hell, I would say, you know, 10.40-ish. Guys, mind you, look at how close. Okay, I showed you guys this earlier, but I'll show you all one more time. Look at how close... Um. Your boy OJ lived to um, Nicole at the time, okay? We're talking about a five-minute drive, two miles, okay? So he could have easily gotten him out of there quickly. Oh, Nicole's fingernails had skin and blood that did not match OJ. We know that, guys, right? That's a big one right there. The LAPD forgot to mention, they, they they didn't, you know, make a serious note of that, which I thought was extremely strange, you know, that they didn't pursue that. You know, you got blood under her fingernail that doesn't match the main perpetrator. You need to figure out who the hell it belongs to. A black Navy cat found at the crime scene had hair and animal fibers that did not match OJ. So two things now that didn't match OJ, guys. OJ never wore any caps. This is true. You don't see him wearing hats often.
There he is. Chase was photographed wearing a different color cap weeks after the murders. We the jury in the above entitled action find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of penal code section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. All of OJ's children are excited for his release, all except Jason. He felt guilty for putting his father through hell. I mean, that's a speculation, but... OJ tried to explain that everything that Jason did in an interview, he changed Jason's name to Charlie so that investigators wouldn't look into him. Charlie had followed this guy and wanted to make sure it was no problem. And he brought the knife. As Jason brings the knife. Things got <laughs> heated. Uh, I just remember Nicole. His chef knife, fell. which matches the wounds. Jason attacks Nicole. Exactly. Because he just said, Nicole fell randomly. What the hell? That don't make sense. Come on. And hurt herself. And uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed the knife. I do remember that portion. Takes knife away from Jason. <laughs> Taking the knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. OJ didn't want to describe the brutal details of Jason murdering Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman on live television, of course. I'm standing there. And there's all kind of stuff around. And... Um, um, what kind of stuff? Blood. One of Jason's former classmates tried to reach out to him in Atlanta, GA, but never found him. Jason's whereabouts remain unknown. He's 52 years old now, guys. Pay very close attention to Jason's face after the verdict is read. He hasn't displayed any emotion like the rest of his family is, and there are clearly no signs of any tears on his face. Look at his face after the sister of Ron Goldman starts to cry in the courtroom. Now he's crying like crazy. Yeah, so he might be in Atlanta. I'm looking it up right now. No one really knows where the hell this guy is at. So, okay. Now I'm going to give y'all my uh, analysis on this. We're almost, you know, th three and a half hours into this bad boy. So, guys, this is what I think happened. I think that it was OJ and his son working together in tandem to get Nicole killed. And they did not anticipate that ron goldman was going to be there okay or they were watch it's one of the two either they didn't anticipate him being there or they're like you know what we can get rid of him too fuck him you know because again we knew that they had some kind of relationship and oj is an old man at this point guys he's 40 almost 50 years old at this point his son much younger bigger uh obviously has an anger problem as well i think that he went ahead and solicited the you know his son to help him and they both carried it out together. This looked like a two-man job. 
because even Jason himself, right, you know, going ahead against someone like Ron Goldman, who's fit, whatever it may be. Obviously, yes, he's a raging lunatic, which is going to give him that crazy strength. But I think it was a two man job. They worked together and they were able to have it and make it happen. I don't think that OJ showed up. On, number one, I don't think OJ could have done it by himself because he probably would have been uh, bested by Ron Goldman and his uh, and his fitness and his age and his ability to defend himself. And then also on top of that, you know, between the screaming, everything else like that, it would have been very difficult to, for him to control that situation. Remember, the guy's old, has arthritis, isn't necessarily in the best of shape, older, etc. I think he used his son. They had they had paid that guy, right? Um, wise. He had done surveillance. They had been watching her. They knew that this guy, Goldman guy was probably going to show up. Said, fuck it, we can take them both on. Boom. They make it happen. They knock Nicole down. They beat the shadow of Ron Goldman. It looks like he probably was getting attacked by two individuals at once, which is why they were able to make quick work of him and why it was such a bloody scene. And then they were able to go ahead, finish Nicole, and get the hell out of there. That's what I think happened. And that's and and the forensic evidence shows it, right? From you know Ron Goldman being easily subdued, right? But, but obviously there being a fight, but him get being subdued, even though he's a trained fighter, that didn't make sense. Um, and then also with the blood. The footprints showing that there was more than one per, uh, potential perpetrator there. The hat being there. The nail, uh, the nails on Nicole, right? That didn't match OJ's blood, even though she had blood under her fingernails. It didn't match her blood or Ron Goldman, so it must have been the attacker. And they didn't match OJ, so it must have been someone else. And they never went ahead and pursued Jason. And they didn't want to pursue Jason because obviously it was a black eye to the LAPD. It was a black eye to the D district attorney's office. And they're like, "Fuck this! We took an L on the biggest stage. We don't care anymore." You know, and they more most importantly, they can't get OJ, okay, because they already he had already been um found innocent of murder. And it's not gonna be as sexy to go after his son. Who cares? Right? They'll be like, ah, you know what? No, no, we're not gonna revisit this. It would cost us a bunch of money. It cost the city of LA, I think, nine or ten million dollars to prosecute the case. It cost OJ ten million dollars to defend himself in the case, and he hasn't even paid Shapiro or any of these other guys. A lot of them are still mad at him because he hasn't paid all his legal fees. Okay. So that is my theory on what I think happened of I think was more probable. It was a two man job, father and son. OJ defended his, uh OJ took the bullet for his son, was willing to, you know, fight it for his son. And honestly, the 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 less the less witnesses the better and the son was able to come up with a solid alibi and distance himself from the investigation and LAPD was just so, you know, hell bent on getting rid of uh OJ that they didn't even care about his son. You know, the sexier target was OJ. Let's put him in jail. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that video, man. That was a bit, that was a good one, man. I really enjoyed doing that breakdown for y'all. I did a lot of research for that episode. So please like the video, man. Subscribe to the channel. And I'll catch you guys on the next episode of Fed It with the documentary breakdowns. Peace. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations. Okay, guys, HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Feta covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of two meditative murder. Racketeering and RICO conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendant's uh, 6 9 and then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, 6 9 ran. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearm.